gusto natin madinig ang kanyang panig dito dahil alam natin na uh, very strong views ang uh, hawak niya dito at uh, napag-aralan niya na mabuti. So, thank you for uh, allowing the creation of the subcommittee, uh, uh, Senator Robin, Chairman Robin, at uh, we'll give you first crack uh, for your uh, opening remarks, sir. A'udhu billahi minas shaitanur rajim, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahir wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Isang uh, pagbati po ng isang magandang magandang umaga po. Isang bagong umaga para sa inang bayang Pilipinas. At ako po ay uh, uh, umaapaw po ang kaligayahan sa aking puso sapagkat yung akin pong uh, idol senator na uh, yung pong matatawag kong uh, isa sa mentor ko po dito sa uh, Senado ay akin pong uh, kasama at uh, siya po ang uh, chairman ng subcommittee na ito. Alam niyo po, isa pong uh, karangalan talaga na isang, uh, isang senador na abogado, isang senador na ekonomista, siya po ngayon ang uh, chairman ng subcommittee na ito. Maraming salamat po sa usapin na yan. Sa mga taga-pangulo po, uh, dadating naman po ang ating uh, Ginoong Pangulo. Babanggitin ko na rin po siya. Maraming salamat sa aming uh, Ginoong Pangulo, uh, Senator Mick Subiri, sapagkat uh, siya po ang uh, namuno sa hakbang, hakbangin na ito na maamendahan ang uh, economic provision sa Saligang Batas. Ako po ay sumasaludo sa aming uh, uh, Ginoong Pangulo. Ako din po ay uh, nagbibigay pugay kay uh, Sir Gary Teves, ang akin pong tumata yung economic advisor at uh, ako po ay naliligayahan at uh, kasama po natin siya ngayon uh, bilang isang uh, atin pong uh, uh, resource speaker. At ganun din po ang aking kaibigan na si Orion. Sir, maraming salamat po at nandito po kayo. Noong paman, batid naman po ninyo ang aking damdamin tungkol sa pag-amienda ng ating saligang batas. Simula nang ako ay mahalal bilang senador at may talagang tagapangulo ng kumiting ito, ay isinulong na po ng inyong lingkod ang mga mungkahing susog, partikular sa mga pang-ekonomiyang probisyon na sa aking paniniwala ay nagiging hadlang sa ating pag-arangkada tungo sa tunay na pag-unlad. Subukan po nating lagyan ng konteksto. Ang ilan sa mga economic provision sa 1987 Constitution na hinahangad nating amendahan ay minana pa po natin sa mga naunang saligang batas. Marami-rami ng dekada ang nakalipas. Ito po ang panahong sariwa pa sa kaisipan at damdamin ng mga bumalangkas ng Constitution ang napakahabang mga taon ng pananakop na mga dayuhan sa ating bayan. Kaya't pinalakas ang Filipino first. Ito ang prinsipyong isinasaisip at isinapuso ng mga delegado. Fast forward po tayo sa kasalukuyan. Ano po ba ang kinaharap ng Pilipinas bilang isang bansa sa kontemporaryong panahon? Meron pong isang termino, globalisasyon. By definition, Globalization is the word used to describe the growing interdependence of the world's economies, cultures, and populations brought about by cross-border trade in goods and services, technology, and flows of investment, people, and information. Sa isang kalungkutan, ang mahihigpit na provision po sa ating saligang batas ay hindi na angkop sa pandaidigang Kalakaran sa ekonomiya. Nabanggit na rin po natin ito noon. Sa kasalukuyan ng ating bansa ay pangatlo sa walumput tatlo na ekonomiya. Sa pinakamahigpit sa mga regulasyon, regulasyon base sa foreign direct investment regulatory restrictiveness index ng Organization for Economic Cooperation Development. Base sa Foreign Direct Investment Attractiveness Scorecard noong 2020, ang Pilipinas ay nasa dulo. 
13th sa 14th na ekonomiya sa Asia Pacific. Pang 13 po tayo sa 14 na ekonomiya sa Asia Pacific. Batid naman po natin sinubukan na itong gamutin sa pamamagitan ng pagpasa ng Public Services Act. Subalit nga po, nung ating binigyan diin nung nakaraan at binanggit din ng ating Senate President Juan Miguel Subiri, ang nakabimbing pang-question po nito sa Korte Suprema ay nagbibigay pa rin ng alinlangan sa mga dayuhang mamumuhunan. Ito po ang dahilan kung kaya't hindi pa tayo makaarangkada sa implementasyon ng patas. Sa paghahain po ng resolusyon bilang anim ng ating mga iginagalang na mga senador, Senate President Subiri, Senadora Ligarda at Senador Angara, natutuwa po ako na mabibigyan ng pagkakataon ang diskusyon sa pagpapaluwag ng ating konstitusyon tungkol sa mga restriksyon sa mga pampublikong kagamitan, institusyong pang-edukasyon, at industriya ng advertising. Ako po ay nagpapasalamat sa tagapangulo ng Senado sa kanyang malawat na pangunawa sa prinsipyong aking tinitindigan, gayon din sa aking mga kasamahan dito sa Senado. Muli po, ako po ay nagpupugay sa ating Pangulo ngayon ng subcommittee na ito, Sen. Sani Angara, sapagkat ito pong hakbang na ito ay tunay na aking pong pinaniniwalaan na makatutulong sa pagkulat ng ating bansa at makawala po sa tanikala ng pangungutang sapagkat sa usapin po ng lohika kapag ka may investment ibig sabihin may puhunan kapag ka may puhunan ay merong iikot na pera at pag umikot ng pera magkakaroon po ng trabaho magkakaroon ng tamang sweldo at magkakaroon po ng ibig sabihin ng pagtakbo at pag-ikot ng ekonomiya. Kaya muli po, maraming salamat at mabuhay po. Maraming maraming salamat, uh, Chairperson Senator Robin Padilla, ang chair ng ating Committee on Constitutional Amendments. Salamat sa... Thank you for the kind words, uh, Senator Chairman Robin. At gusto nating kilalanin din po uh, ang ating mga kasamahan na kakarating lang po. Uh, Senator Risa Contiveros, our uh, chair Morning, of chair. the Committee on Women. Good morning, ma'am and the Deputy Minority Leader as well. Uh, Senator J.B. Herzito, our Deputy Majority Leader and the Chair of the Senate Committees on Housing and Local Government. Uh, and of Senator Wynne Gachalian, our uh, hardworking Chair of the Committee on Basic Education and uh, you know, Energy. I always think your energy. <laughs> um, ways and Means. Uh, good morning, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for your trust uh, and the Chairman's trust in uh, having me chair this committee. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our very distinguished guests, and uh, we're very fortunate today to have them with us. We, also, we have them in person as well as online. Uh, we have no less than former Chief Justice Hilario Davide Jr., uh, who is with us. Uh, I think he's come all the way from Cebu. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have former Justice Adolf Ascuna, uh, who was also here last week uh, for the uh, suffrage or uh, electoral reforms uh, hearing. And also we have uh, online another framer of the Constitution, Attorney Christian Monsod. Can you hear us, Attorney Monsod? Yeah. Morning, sir. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, and our legal luminaries, no, uh, a known constitutionalist, uh, Justice Vicente, or VV for short, Mendoza. Good morning, sir. Uh, we have from the IBP, or the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, representing uh, uh, President Pido, is Attorney Marlo Distura. Morning, sir. Uh, and of course, not just legal luminaries, meron din po tayong magagaling na mga ekonomista. Uh, we have Dr. Gerardo Sikat from the UP School of Economics, who was uh, one of the first NEDA uh, Director Generals, if I'm not mistaken, sir. Uh, we have, uh, maybe we could say from the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, uh, Sunny Africa, uh, an, a graduate of... Uh, they say it's a good institution, uh, the London School of Economics and representing the Ebon Foundation. Good morning, sir. Uh, we have a former finance secretary, uh, Gary Tevez, uh, is with us. Sir, good morning. And uh, from the Constitutional Reform and Reunification Movement, we have uh, Mr. Orion Perez Dumdum. Morning, sir. Uh, Thank you. We invited more, more, but I think some could not make it and some submitted their position papers, which we will share 
with the members of the committee and the public. Hopefully, we can post those online as well. So I'd just like to ask, uh, before I turn it over to our distinguished uh, uh, resource persons, tatanong ko lang po sa ating kasamahan, baka meron silang uh, pangunahing uh, gustong sabihin or initial remarks. Uh, Your Honors, yeah. Senator Teresa, go ahead, ma'am. Salamat, Mr. Chair, at uh, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Um, maraming salamat po sa inyo. Salamat kasi ang hearing natin na ito para sa resolution of both houses, RBH 6, ay tanda na parang suspended rin muna ang diskusyon dito sa Kongreso niyang huwad na People's Initiative. Kaya sana nga yung temporary suspension ng COMELEC ng mga proceedings sa PI maging permanent na rin. Itapo na natin sa basurahan yung PI na yan. In any case, dear colleagues, hindi po nabawasan ng pag-alala ko sa mga probiso ng saligang batas na nais i-amienda ng RBH 6. Kaya salamat po sa pagkakatong pag-usapan nito. Dahil magbabantay talaga ako na hindi tayo mahaluan ng mga panukalang magpapahina lang sa ating demokrasya. I will definitely be one of those not to allow any provisions that will make our critical industries and institutions and our irreplaceable resources vulnerable to foreign takeover and exploitation. Sa bagay, mas madali kasing sisihin ang walang kamalay-malay na dokumento kaysa sisihin ang mga totoong dahilan. Korapsyon, red tape, malabong burokrasya, at mataas na singil ng kuryente ang nagtataboy sa mga lokal at dayuhan na investor. Walang pananagutan ang 1987 Constitution sa mga bagay na yon. Una sa lahat, yung sinasabi nilang restrictive, restrictive, di umano, hindi po yan totoo. Bukas na bukas na po ang ating tindahan, ladies and gentlemen. We have introduced numerous legislation that have already liberalized our sectors. Ilan lang dito ang RA 10641 or amendments to the Foreign Bank Liberalization Act, the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, the Public Service Act, the Foreign Investments Act. So much of the Philippine economy is already open to foreign participation. Kung restrictions lang sa ekonomiya ang pag-uusapan, yung ating kapitbahay na Singapore, na mamayang pag kahit na may restrictions sa critical industries at public utilities. Ang ibang bansa sa ASEAN, gaya ng Thailand at Indonesia, may kanya-kanya ding industriya na inaalagaan. Eh, tayo? Kulelat pa rin. Kahit maluwag na nga ang ekonomiya at marami ng provision para makapasok ang pera. Kaya hindi po solusyon <coughs> ang cha-cha. Kahit sa sabi nilang purely economic provisions para bawasan ang mga tunay na iniinda natin. Yung mismong roadmap nga ng pamahalaan sa pag-unlad, ang Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028. Wala ding, wala ding nabanggit na dapat mag cha para tumami ang trabaho, buksain ang kahirapan, at pataasin ang kalidad ng buhay ng bansa. Wala ito sa napag-usapan. Kaya, huwag sana nating gawing collateral damage ang konstitusyon, ang mismong kaluluwa ng bansa. We, the Filipino people, will determine our destiny, hindi yung ambisyon lang ng iilan. Hindi rin natin hahayaang mabaliwala ang pagsisikap ng ating mga mamamayan, ng civil society, mga mass movements, na gumawa ng paraan para magkaroon ng totoong pagbabago sa lipunan sa pamamagitan ng lehitimong paraan kaysa sa ginagawa ng mga ilehitimong puwersa dyan sa tabi-tabi na tinira tayo ng pailalim. May the 1987 Constitution light our discussions today, ladies and gentlemen. Handa po akong makinig at makibahagi, Mr. Chair. Salamat po. Well said, uh, Senator Risa. Uh, I'd just like, to, before I uh, recognize uh, Senator Wynn, we'd just like to acknowledge some of our colleagues who have arrived. Uh, Chair of uh, the Committee on National Defense, uh, 
uh, a public order, sorry, public order. Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa, former chief of the PNP. And of course, our, uh, very much in the news, our chair of the Committee on uh, Electoral Reforms, the uh, favorite sister of the president, <laughs> Senator Amy Marcos. Madam, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Senator Wynne, yes, please. Uh, go thank ahead. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a brief opening statement. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, chairman of the subcommittee for hearing of my resolution. I actually filed the, uh, my, my first version uh, of this um, amendment to the economic provisions of our constitution in 2019, which is the previous Congress. And I would like to, gusto ko rin po pasalamatan po ang chairman ng mother committee na ito, Committee on Constitutional Amendments, for holding 10 hearings Mr. Chairman, nationwide, no? from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Uh, Cebu, Chair Baguio, Davao. Yeah. I'd like to acknowledge also our majority leader, uh, yeah. that's Senator Villanueva, and this is Senator Gatsalian. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead <laughs> Senator <you>. Gatsalian. <laughs> thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, Chairman uh, Robin Padilla for starting the uh, ball rolling uh, with 10 hearings. And in fact, I read parts of his... Uh, hearing, I uh, read the parts of the transcript of his hearings, and there were a lot of things covered, and it's good to uh, discuss uh, those items in greater detail uh, in the days to come. But Mr. Chairman, I'd like to flash a few, few slides no, that led me to file this, uh, this uh, resolution. First is the FDI restrictive index that was mentioned by uh, Chairman uh, Senator Robin Padilla, we're second in the whole world in terms of restrictedness, in terms of opening up our economy. And because of that restrictiveness, uh, the FDI inward inflow in ASEAN, and this is the next slide, uh, we're actually at the tail end of the pack in terms of attracting uh, FDIs. And if you look at Singapore, which is a, a smaller country compared to us, they're attracting more than five six times more FDI compared to our country. So, Mr. Chairman, this led me to file this resolution. And admittedly, there are many uh, issues and details that we need to discuss, especially unintended consequences. And uh, I'm here to um, listen to our panel of experts as to what are the uh, potential uh, unintended consequences that we need to uh, safeguard. But the overall goal of this representation is to create more jobs by opening up our economy, speed up our growth by attracting more FDIs to our country, and hopefully, hopefully, by uh, uh, amending our constitution, we can attract critical um, uh, foreign direct investments to critical industries in our country. So again, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, uh, hearing this uh, resolution. And I thank, again, uh, Senator Robin Padilla for uh, hosting 10 hearings uh, in this uh, uh, in this measure. Thank you. Parang sinasabi mo, Senwin, dapat mag-10 hearings din ako. Ha? Baka hindi matuwa yung ating mga kaibigan sa kabilang kapulong. But thank you. Thank you for sharing with us those uh, very important facts. Uh, any other any other preliminary remarks from our colleagues uh, before we uh, go to our... Yes, uh, Senator Amy. Yes, uh, very briefly, as uh, your former chairman of economic affairs, the truth is that I was in uh, close contact with most of our foreign investors and locators almost daily. And never once did they mention a change in the Constitution. Each time they stated that there was a need for uh, lower rates of electricity, infinitely better infrastructure, less red tape, and a predictable and reliable regulatory framework. At no point did they say that uh, the Constitution needed to be changed. Having said that, uh, I am also puzzled by uh, the list that has been provided for public services, given the many problems we have had with NGCP and the constant investigations here in the Senate. We are all fully aware that basic education as well as all aspects of private education are shrinking in revenue, in number, and in uh, employment. So why education will be turned over for foreigners, for our children, also being converted into aliens is a puzzlement to me. Finally, the uh, addition of advertising is also somewhat bizarre, given that the large advertising multinationals are already present in the country, and that advertising involves very little investment at all. 
Having said that on the, on the economic uh, aspect, may I also um, get uh, perhaps some uh, clarity on the manner by which the so-called restrictive economic provision shall be amended. The Senate version passed by our good chairman um, indicates a constituent assembly, without mentioning the name, but uh, clearly stating that three-fourths would be involved. However, the House version calls for a constitutional convention, or at least that's what I understand from what was passed in third reading in March earlier last year. So if we could be elucidated on the process for the CONCON, uh, which would clearly be far more expensive, and which would, in fact, surrender the control of both houses over the subject matter once the constitutional convention has been elected and convened. So what safeguards do we have? And uh, what uh, choice do we have between the CONCON and the CONAS, um, which, once again, is a difference between the two houses? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very much, uh, Senator Aimee. Very good questions, very good points, and we will seek clarity from our learned resource persons in due time. Uh, yes, Senator Bato, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just would like to state uh, for the record that uh, I am here to support you in this uh, endeavor as our, uh, as our uh, subcommittee chairman and also our uh, main com mother committee chairman, Senator Rubino Padilla. And uh, I would like to listen to uh, our uh, esteemed, highly esteemed uh, resource persons na yung ibang pangalan ay memorize, memorize ko na nung ako ay uh, elementary pa. Memorize ko na sa aking uh, subject na social studies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Binima Jo, parang nagpapabata ka daw, sabi niya. <laughs> Makakalage ka na daw nun, sabi niya. Uh, just joking. Thank you very much for the statement of support, which is very much appreciated, uh, Senator Bato. Uh, if there are, um, our Majority Leader, wishes to? Yes, Mr. Majority Mr. Leader, Chairman, Senator Joel. Thank you, uh, and uh, good morning to our dear colleagues, especially to our resource persons. This will be uh, just very brief, just like uh, Senator Bato de la Rosa, I'm here to uh, support our colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, to Senator Robin Padilla, who exhaustively uh, uh, um, heard so many uh, issues about uh, this particular uh, deliberation, and of course, our uh, subcommittee chair, uh, Chairman uh, Sani Angara. I think it is important to note that uh, ang Senado ay tunay na may isang salita, Mr. President. Um, we began our hearing today consistent with our commitment the commitment of our Senate President to the President to explore and study amendments to the economic provisions of uh, the uh, Constitution. This will be exhaustive hearings. Unlike itong uh, Peking PI, hindi naman ito irarash. Um, we will do it right and we will follow our timetable, one that ensures that all voices are heard. This will be um, transparent. Our people will know what is going on and what we are talking about. Wala po tayong itatago dito at higit sa lahat, wala pong kalokohan gaya ng mga nadiskubre ng ating mga kasamahan nung nagpunta sila sa Davao, ni Senator Aimee, Senator Bato, and Senator uh, Bongo. Ang Senado po kasi, uulitin ko, ay may isang salita. May isang salita. This was our commitment from the very beginning and the only... And uh, we only went off track because of this ill-fated uh, Peking initiative that was pushed by uh, some quarters with the support of the uh, House of Representatives. At klaro po yan, wala naman pong naniniwala na sa kanila na wala silang kinalaman dito. We have been told that if the Senate will tackle RBH 6, goodbye PI na raw. Gayun pa man, we will continue to be vigilant habang to protect the processes involved in amending our charter while we make sure that RBH 6 sticks to the original intention to amend only uh, economic provisions of the Constitution, we will also continue to be proactive in our measures to thwart unconstitutional chacha efforts. Kasama dito po yung uh, investigation natin dyan na pinangungunahan ni uh, Senator Aimee uh, Marcos. Dinawin ko lang po kasi yung sinasabing ceasefire, eh, 
ceasefire sa usapin ng uh, PI. Kaya we will refrain from debating on this uh, issue. Pero yung ceasefire po does not mean cease working or stop the PI inquiry. Kasi siyempre kung may nakita po tayong sablay, tumatawa si Senator Bato kasi ang dami na niyang nakitang sablay eh. Pag may nakitang sablay ang Senado, uh, talagang iimbestigahan po ito. Hindi naman tayo magkikibit-balikat. Yung ongoing hearings are in the process of unearthing evidence and nakita naman po natin, meron talagang questionable sa pagpapirma ng Peking Initiative. May mali po. Why should we turn a blind eye to these irregularities? Ang dami pong tanong, sino ang nagpondo sa kampanya? Saan galing itong pondo ng PI? Bakit nagkaroon ng traffic doon sa Forbes noong kuhanan ng 2.5? Bakit may traffic? Bakit ang mga chief of staff eh, nagkukumahog na pumunta doon? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ayaw natin na uh, masayang yung salapi ng taong bayan. Kaya ho tayo narito ngayon to, to make sure that uh, we will hear this uh, exhaustively and uh, uh, with transparency. The people have the right to know if their money is being used properly for their benefit and not for the benefit of a political agenda. Ang uh, gusto kasi nung iba, forgive and forget na lang. Hindi naman po tama yun. Hindi na kami magsasalita tungkol sa PI but we should let the witnesses speak and we should let the evidence speak and at the end of the day kung may gumawa ng labag sa batas those responsible should be held accountable. Sa so, chairman, ang bottom line po sa ginagawa ng Senado, eh, yung ating trabaho. Trabaho po natin ito kaya naman uh, sabay natin yung pagdinig at pag-investigate kasi hindi naman tayo ganun kabisi sa paggawa ng mga resolusyon supporting our Senate President or supporting Senator Amy Marcos. Kasi dito po sa Senado, alam na natin kung ano yung tama at hindi kailangan ng mga ganyan kasi alam naman nila that they have the support of the Senate. Maraming salamat, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Majority Leader. Of course, we will take guidance from you as our uh, the, one of the heads of the institution. Thank you very much. Uh, any others? Uh, Senator JB, yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, just briefly. Anyway, we are here to listen. Just like to also um, recognize your efforts so that uh, we could already start the ball rolling and uh, prevent, uh, prevent this uh, um, constitutional crisis, if I may say. And also, uh, and, uh, also give recognition to our chair of the Constitu Constitutional Amendments Committee, Senator Robin Hood Padilla, for... Uh, for starting this. We are in a democratic society and uh, as they say, we have um, all, uh, all the bright, bright ideas are needed no? uh, in these uh, discussions. Anyway, Mr. Chair, um, what we should be um, looking at right now is on how we will be able to improve the quality of lives of our people. Um, in, in our efforts here in the Senate, uh, on my part, we already shepherded the Public-Private yeah. Partnership Act, and will soon sponsor the Comprehensive Infrastructure for Master Plan sure. for um, for us to be able to attract for investments. But as they say, um, our constitution was written in 1987, 40 years, and uh, the world has changed considerably. There's, uh, uh, there's There was no such thing as globalization, worldwide web back then. The world has become smaller. And uh, I do agree that we have to discuss on what we will be able to do on how we'll be able to attract for investors. Medyo nakakabahala lang, nakakano, nakalungkot tignan yung FDIs that we are getting. Doon sa pinakitang graph ni Sen. Sherwin, uh, we are really lagging behind. But uh, Mr. Chair, we in the Senate, we are not, uh, hindi po ako uh, sangayo na hindi tayo nagtatrabaho. In fact, uh, we have mentioned that we have already started um, um, hearing on the priority measures that is designed on improving our economy. No? Um, yung comprehensive master plan, uh, public-private partnership act, and the rest. Again, we have to look into uh, infrastructure, energy, and uh, uh, a lot more things that, uh, that need to be prioritized so that we will be able to stimulate economic growth and provide jobs and opportunities to our people. So again, Mr. Chair, I, uh, congratulations for in advance no, for, uh, for having this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator JV, for the support and the 
very good uh, remarks. We have with us, we'd like to acknowledge the head of our institution, no less than the Senate President, Senate President Juan Miguel Zubiri, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, to my dear colleagues, Senator Sani Angala, our chairman of the subcommittee, together with the chairman, uh, Senator Robin Hood Padilla, to all my colleagues, uh, and of course the guests, all our friends, the uh, legal luminaries from the uh, legal community, thank you for joining us today. And um, we also have today economists joining us. I know Tito Gary is here uh, and others that are, are going to assist us in ferret, ferreting out the best uh, way possible to remove the possible economic restrictions uh, in the Constitution. Uh, we'd, like, we'd just like to put on record that the Senate is working very hard uh, to listen to the clamor of certain sectors to look at and revisit the 1987 Constitution. Uh, but we will not be f falling into a trap on any deadline because to discuss uh, such an important matter needs time. It needs study. It cannot be rushed like any regular bill that is just approved without thinking. So we, ladies and gentlemen here in the Senate, will make sure that we deliberate this as much as possible and come up with the best outcome for our people. Um, and so with that, I give my full support to our chairperson, Senator Sani Angara. The timeline is in your hands if you feel uh, it uh, uh, necessary that we must discuss this with all members of society, not only our learned luminaries here, as well as different sectors that will be affected by proposed amendments to our Constitution. So we leave it all up to you, my dear colleagues, my dear chairman. Uh, you have the full trust and confidence of this institution. And uh, again, let us not listen to the noise. Let us be above the fray. The Senate, as an institution, should be men, states, men and women that will always look at the best possible outcome for our country, not for our localities, but for our country. And therefore, let us filter out the noise and focus on the work at hand. So, mabuhay pong Senado, mabuhay Republican ng Pilipinas. Thank you very much, Chair. Maraming maraming salamat, Senate President Zubiri. We totally agree with you. We thank you for your authority and we thank you for standing as a statesman uh, these past few weeks, which have been very trying times for uh, country and uh, I think there will be challenges ahead and uh, with you at the helm uh, we are fully fully uh, behind you uh, in all your actions. Salamat po sa support. Uh, the chair I just wishes to state that uh, reiterate my colleague's stand that uh, this is not something that needs to be rushed uh, given the importance kung yung pangkaraniwang uh, patakaran ay uh, uh, ay talagang dinidebate natin mas lalo na po dahil ito ay pinakamahalaga o pinakamataas na batas sa bansa ang mismong saligang batas at pangalawa po uh, klaro naman dun sa sinabi ng ating mga kasama na although maganda yung constitutional reform hindi ito sapat uh, wag natin isipin na ito ay isang milagro na pag pinasa natin ay darating bigla at kakatok sa ating mga pintuan ang mga uh, mamumuhunan at mga negosyante. Dahil tulad ng sinabi ng ating mga kasama, maraming factors po yan. Yung ease of doing business, yung rule of law, yung uh, kasiguruhan na re-respetuhin yung mga kontrata, yung uh, uh, red tape ay babawasan o yung mga kahirapan sa birokrasya, you know, there are so many factors, and we know this because there are so many surveys. And as mentioned by some of our colleagues, hindi naman sa taas yung constitutional reform. Pero hindi naman to ibig sabihin na hindi makakatulong ang constitutional reform. To the extent that it can, by all means, let us explore the possibilities. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our guests. Uh, and with, uh, with your permission, colleagues, we'd like to uh, start with former Chief Justice uh, Hilario Davide Jr., who was one of the framers of the 1987 Constitution before he became the Chief Magistrate. Good morning, Chief Justice Davide. Sir, uh, we'd like to hear from you, please, uh, on uh, resolution number six regarding the economic uh, provisions of the Constitution. Thank you, sir. You have the floor. Uh, how much time would be given me? Uh, well, sir, uh, given the importance of the subject matter, uh, it would be ideal if you could uh, 
uh, spend uh, how much time do you need, sir? <laughs> Probably 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very yes. much. Sean. Yes, please. Good morning to all of you. I thank the Honorable Chairman and the members of the subcommittee for inviting me to this uh, public hearing on Senate Resolution of both houses number six. I am deeply honored. I shall henceforth refer to this resolution as Senate RBH 6. I have some preliminary statements that concern some procedural matters. To save time, however, I shall uh, just proceed directly to the issues concerning the Senate Bill uh, RBH 6. Let me start with a reiteration of my firm and unchangeable stand that there are no valid, serious, and compelling reasons to amend our 1987 Constitution. What our country and our people need today are not amendments to or revision of the Constitution, but the full implementation of its principles and state policies solemnly enshrined in its Article 2 and mandatory and provisions in its body. In about 150 instances, our Constitution orders the state or Congress to implement them by these solemn commands. Congress shall give highest priority to the state shall, Congress shall, as provided by law, as established by law, or in accordance with law. However, either intentionally and with evident bad faith, or incompetence, or neglect of duty on the part of our concerned government officials, the state or Congress have not fully and meaningfully complied with these constitutional commands and mandates. Hence, a vast majority of the provisions, especially on social justice, on economic development, on abolition of political justice, among many others, have remained unimplemented to the great prejudice of our people, especially the poor, the marginalized, the underprivileged, or, open quote, the least, the last, and the lost, close quote. If at all there is a need to amend the Constitution, it must be based on the most compelling grounds or reasons. It must, foremost, be for the best interest of the country and the people now and in the future, and not for a chosen few. It is to solve serious problems, not to create new ones. It must be in pursuance of and in compliance with the declared principles and state policies at the call to of the Constitution. With these standards and tests in mind, let us now take a hard and serious look at the resolution of both houses number six Without saying it in clear language, it considers or describes the constitutional provisions covered by the proposal to be the culprits or causes that hindered or will continue to hinder economic growth. There are obstacles to economic development or progress. I must forthwith say that the provisions proposed to be amended and all other provisions of the national economy, such as those proposed to be amended in the House of Representatives resolution of both houses number two, which include the economic provisions pertaining to agriculture, land ownership, and lease, are not the culprits or the causes of our massive social, economic, political, moral, and ethical problems and debacles. These are all caused by the failures to fully implement or enforce the Constitution, by poor governance and accountability, and open violations of the public trust character of the public office enshrined in Section 1 of Article 11 of the Constitution, which provides, open code, public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times, be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency, and act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives. I repeat, 
Our problems are not due to the restrictive economic provisions of the Constitution. They cannot be solved by removing its restrictive economic provisions and completely leaving to Congress, leaving to Congress their future under the clause unless otherwise provided by law. On the contrary, they would create more serious and disturbing problems and consequences, which I will show later. Let us now look deeper into the proposals of Senate Resolution of both houses no number six on the provision on education. It leaves to Congress the power to change at any time the Filipino citizenship requirement in the basic education. I repeat, basic education. Again, that in our educational system, we have the basic, the senior high, and the tertiary education. The proposal opens to foreign control or dominance. Our basic education, which is the most crucial in the development and growth of our young. This would run counter to Section 17 of Article 2 of the Declaration of Principles and State Policies of our Constitution, which provides, open code, the state shall give priority to education, science and technology, arts, culture and sports, to foster patriotism and nationalism, accelerate social progress, and promote total human liberation and development, close school. Then, with foreign control or dominance in our basic education, basic education, we would put asunder the noble patriotic and nationalistic virtues which are constitutionally mandated to be a part of the curricula of all educational institutions provided for in paragraph two of section three of article 14 of the Constitution, which reads, section two, paragraph two, they shall inculcate patriotism and nationalism. Again, patriotism and nationalism. Foster love of humanity, respect for human rights, appreciation of the roles of national heroes in the historical development of the country. Teach the rights and duties of citizenship. Strengthen ethical and spiritual values develop moral character and personal discipline, encourage critical and creative thinking, broaden scientific and technological knowledge, and promote vocational efficiency. Close quote. Can we expect foreigners at the helm or control our, of our educational system to seriously and heartily obey this state policy on education and curricula mandates. For instance, if a Chinese educational entity would now come in, do you expect it to be faithful enough to comply with these mandates? Would not its teachings focus on Chinese philosophy or even on the life of Mao Zedong? As regards the proposals affecting the provisions of public utilities, and the advertising industry, suffice it to say that as to the first, there are already amendments to the Public Service Act. In any case, it would be extremely dangerous, I repeat, extremely dangerous, if we leave to Congress the extent of the Filipino citizenship requirement therein. The day will not be far when public utilities and advertising industry will be under the control or even under the full ownership by aliens. One Congress declares a 100 Filipino, another Congress a 75-25 Filipino, another Congress a 50-50 Filipino, another a 25-75 Chinese, and even perhaps a 100% Chinese. The amendment would be grossly disadvantageous to our local businessmen and corporations or business entities engaged in the public utility 
and advertising industries. I repeat what I had been asserting before, that relaxing the Filipino citizenship requirement in the economic provisions of the country would easily convert our Congress into a fee, FEE, all capital, market, of lobbyists of foreign countries or businessmen to obtain amendments in their favor. Congress would cease to be a free FREE -E market of noble, nationalistic, patriotic ideals and ideas. Remember that the Senate is the conscience of the Republic. Fools rush in where angels fear to drive. Yes, devils will have the day when angels fly away. To conclude, I will not hesitate to say again that amendments to or revision of the Constitution at this time would be a lethal experiment, a fatal leap, a plunge to death, a leap to hell. It will be a cha-cha dance to the grave or to hell. It will be a cruel punishment for a God-loving, patriotic, and nationalistic people. It will be claiming our people to foreign domination or control. God forbid that we now amend our Constitution. God forbid that we now can no longer proudly and with glorious fervor sing, land of the morning, child of the sun returning, with fervor burning, thee do our souls adore. Land dear and holy, cradle of noble heroes, near shall invaders trample thy sacred shore, ever within the skies and through the clouds, and all thy heroes I see, do we behold the radiance Feel the throne of glorious liberty. The one dear to all our hearts, its sun and stars alike, or never shall its shining feet be dimmed by tyrant's mind. Beautiful land of love, O land of light, in thine embrace its rapture to light. But it is glory ever when thou art wrong for us, thy sons, to suffer and die. God bless the Philippines. God bless the Senate. God bless the beleaguered Filipino people. Thank you all for your patience. Less than 15 minutes, Your Honors. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. God bless you for uh, uh, your wise words. Uh, we just want to clarify, I was conferring with the Senate President and the Majority Leader. The Senate President is the main author of the resolution. Uh, we are the co-authors. The, regarding the educational institutions, uh, Chief, it's only uh, meant to apply for to higher uh, tertiary education, not to basic education, precisely because of the uh, fears you enunciated that perhaps uh, uh, nationalism might be watered down, among others. Uh, thank you, but thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, next, we'll go to Justice Ascuna, also, uh, who was here with us and shared his wise words during Senator Aimee's uh, hearing. And uh, uh, we're, we very much welcome his, uh, his knowledge and experience. Uh, Justice, uh, Mr. You have the Chief. floor, sir. Uh, uh, Senator Aimee, if we could reserve our questions uh, no, it's not a for... Question. Uh, yes. It's not a question before uh, we proceed to Justice Ascuna, who uh, brilliantly uh, explained uh, the situation in a previous hearing. I would like to also share with uh, my uh, colleagues the um, uh, really uh, copious as well as bracing position paper that the Chief Justice Davide um, submitted to our committee for the investigation on uh, signature buying. Um, so uh, it's the second time uh, he has helped us and we'd like to thank him. It will certainly deepen and enrich our understanding and the committee report that will be submitted forthwith. Thank you. Thank you very much. That would be most welcome. Thank you, Senator Aimi. Uh, Justice Ascona, Ascona, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Senate President, and members of the Senate. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very important uh, hearing on the 
proposal to amend the Constitution to remove some of the restrictive economic provisions therein. The context of the adoption by our drafters of the present Constitution of uh, restrictive economic provisions uh, goes back to 1935. Our 1935 and 1973 constitutions already contain restrictive economic provisions with respect to development of natural resources, ownership of land, and operation of public utilities. These are not new. If uh, It's because of this that uh, we are in dire poverty. Don't blame the present constitution. It's been there since 1935. What we added in 1987 are restrictive economic provisions in the areas of education, uh, media, advertising. Those are uh, our additions. They were not there before. And uh, in the present resolution of both houses, number six, it is sought to remove uh, or loosen the restrictive portions of these provisions with respect to education, uh, public utilities, and advertising only. Okay. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, removing some, if not all, of the restrictive economic provisions in our Constitution. I believe that it should not be in the Constitution. It should be in an ordinary legislation. I'm for restriction. But it should be flexible. It should be in legislative, legislative form, not in a very hard to change constitutional provision. I think the other countries that have restrictive economic provisions don't have it in their constitution. They have it in ordinary laws, which can be easily changed. Economic provisions, economic policy should be flexible to meet changing times in the economy. In fact, the best definition of an economist that I've heard, pardon the economists who are here, is an economist who can tell you tomorrow why what he said yesterday did not happen today. That is, uh, the, uh, that is the definition of an economist. But seriously, economic policy should not be uh, put in a constitution. Now, what is the, I'll talk about the procedure. What is the procedure to change, to amend? Uh, you have the CONAS, it says Congress, by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, may propose amendment or revision of the Constitution. You can call for a constitutional convention by a vote of two-thirds, again, of Congress. You may call a constitutional convention. Or to a people's initiative which is much controverted right now, where you have signatures by the 12% of entire electorate, represented by 3% every district. However, uh, this is not what is sought to be done here. What is sought to be done here is CONAS. Congress, by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, may propose amendment or revisions to the Constitution. Okay. So resolution of both houses number six is under that, CONAS. It's not a fourth method. There's no such thing as a fourth method. There are only three methods. This is the first method, which is through Congress acting as a constituent assembly. They don't have to meet jointly. There's no requirement for a joint hearing. There is no requirement for a joint voting either. We left that perhaps unintentionally open whether you'll meet together in joint session or meet separately. That's up to you. So Father Bernas said you can follow the same procedure as making an ordinary law. That is, you can present your resolution in the Senate, another resolution in the House, and then have three readings. And if it's adopted, you compare both, and then you reconcile versions, come out with a final version, and then vote three-fourths in the Senate, three-fourths of the House. That is CONAS. That is method number one. Okay. So that's what we seek to do, CONAS. 
However, I notice in your resolution of both houses number six that you start with saying, be it enacted, enacted. That is legislation. So don't say be it enacted, say be it resolved because you are not proposing a bill, you are not proposing to make a law, you are proposing to amend the Constitution, and you have to signal to our people that you are no longer acting as a legislative body, you are acting as a constituent assembly. How do you signal it? You signal it by your resolution, be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives in Congress assembled and so forth and so on. So that's the first change I would propose to resolution of both houses number six. Change the be it enacted into be it resolved. Secondly, I notice that you introduced another word other than unless otherwise provided by law. I, I was the source of this formula unless otherwise provided by law way back when Speaker Belmonte was the Speaker of the House, because I noticed that there was a clamor to change the economic provisions. And I said the best way is just to adopt an amendment that says, unless otherwise provided by law, but strategically placed so that you will not alter the basic principles of protecting our people, but only alter the percentages. So put it where it says 60% must be owned by Filipinos, unless otherwise provided by law. Make it changeable by legislation. But in resolution of both houses number six, you added another word, other than unless otherwise provided by law. You added the word basic, basic. Now I say that's dangerous, why? Because you are inviting the house to add other words than unless otherwise provided by law. This particular change of the restrictive economic provisions should only contain the words unless otherwise provided by law. Otherwise, you open the gates of changing the very substance of the economic provisions itself. So I would suggest, don't use basic. Let the Congress decide what kind of education should be open to foreign investment. So. Leave it, educational institutions, except those that are uh, by religious group, shall be 60% owned by Philippines, unless otherwise provided by law. Ganun lang. That is the second proposal I have. I have no other proposal, just, just those two. And I believe that, uh, of course, this is according to some members of the House, not enough not enough Dow. It will only redound to 3% increase in GDP. I don't know, there are economists here. But it's a start, it's a start. Uh, I think the only difference with RB66 and RBC2 is, is uh, land ownership. You did not include land ownership. I would suggest do not include uh, development of natural resources. Why not? because there is a provision in the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that says that a people may freely dispose of their natural resources as they deem fit. However, however, it says, uh, a people must not be deprived of their means of subsistence. So you cannot deprive our people by freely disposing of our natural resources of their means of subsistence. Now, the natural resources that are reserved to Filipinos are non-renewable. Ito mga minerals natin, non-renewable po yan. Kaya po, since 1935, reserved now for Filipinos only. Anyway, the uh, foreigners can invest in solar energy and wind energy. They are not covered by the provision of the Constitution. Why not? The Constitution says all forces of potential energy are covered by the nationalistic provision. All forces of potential energy. It does not say all potential forces of energy. Please, the World Bank 
ask me for my opinion whether or not solar energy and wind energy are covered in view of the fact that according to them, the Constitution says that what is nationalized or must be owned by Filipinos is all potential forces of energy. That's not what the Constitution says. You read it. It doesn't say all potential forces of energy. It says all forces of potential energy. Okay, Forces of potential energy are waterfalls, cataracts, whereas Potential forces of energy includes solar energy and wind energy. That's not na nationalized. We only nationalize forces of potential energy. So that, that's open to them. Let them invest in that, solar and wind. Uh, that's all for Salamat. Mr. Chair, quick clarificatory question. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll reserve all questions for after the resource persons have spoken, uh, Santa Risa, with your indulgence. Because if we open the gate to questions, we'll not hear from all our resource persons. I hope you understand. That's similar to what we do in the budget. We ask all agencies to present, and then we allow our members to, to, to ask questions. Well, I hope by that time, hindi pa po na laos, kasi it's actually a quick clarificatory question to a point made by uh, CJ Davide, and then uh, answered yes, by the chair. Yes, yes. You'll have a chance to ask later. Thank you. We'd like to acknowledge Senator Jingo Estrada, our chairperson of the Committee on National Defense. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justice Apuna, as Kuna. As usual, very clear and uh, very uh, uh, brilliant analysis. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we also have another framer of the Constitution with us online. Uh, Attorney Monsot, Christian Monsot, also a, a framer of the 1987 Constitution, a member of the 1987 Constitutional Commission. Is he still with us? Yes, uh, Attorney Christian Monsot, uh, good morning, sir. Please. Please go ahead and share your thoughts uh, with the body. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm asked, I was asked to comment on Joint Resolution Number 6, proposing constitutional amendments to the economic provisions on education, public utilities, and advertising. As to the purpose for the amendments, I quote the President in an interview last January 23rd. Quote, the 1987 Constitution was not written for a globalized world. We have to adjust it so we can increase the economic activity in the Philippines and we can attract more foreign investors. This is the same president who a year ago said, for me, all these things being talked about, we can do without changing the Constitution. The president should know better. He is, after all, the chairman of NEDA, which came out about September 2022 with Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028 approved by the president. That states that the country is, quote, open for business and enumerated the enactment of our Republic Act 11647, Republic Act 11659, and uh, on uh, telecommunications and transportation, as well as renewable energy. <clears throat> and there is the APIRA law of 2001, which allows 100% foreign ownership in power generation. The, why did we have uh, shortages of power at the time when 100% uh, foreign owned uh, generation was, was open? Because the generating companies, the foreign investors, well, wanted take or pay provisions from the distributor so that they're, they're assured of their income and profits. And so we had a hard time, I was with Meralco then, in negotiating with these foreign investors. And as for land, lease is allowed for 50 years, even 75 years on government land. By the way, even the Foreign Chamber of Commerce admitted that opening land for foreign ownership will probably will raise the price of land beyond the reach of the poor. As for mining, it is allowed 100% in partnership with government under Article 12, Section 2. And then, of course, there is our signing of the RCEP, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. There is absolutely no mention, as already mentioned earlier, of any charter change 
in the Philippine Development Fund 2023 to 2028 to attain its goals and programs. Moreover, in, the, in none of the 73 billion of investment pledges accrued by the government in its travels abroad, there is no condition for China change. And there is the example of Japanese manufacturing companies leaving China about four years ago, who put the Philippines as destination number four behind Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. When the China, Japanese Chamber of Commerce was asked why, since manufacturing in our constitution is allowed to be 100 foreign owned, there was much discussions on the pros and the cons, like cons that we, that we have good workmen and so on, and the cons, and the, uh, cons which is about lack of materials and manufacturing chain. Manufacturing chain. <clears throat> the regulatory, for example, uh, rules. The, but what was finally the factor against us? They said, country image, which they said, they tried to change, but could not. Part of that image was corruption, including transactional legislation, which would open the door wider by the insertion of that phrase unless otherwise provided by law in the economic provisions of which corrupt politicians and greedy big businesses are very adept. Clearly, there is no need or requirement for charter changes in the Philippine Development Plan in the investment pledges to the government. What then is the purpose of convening a constituent assembly to pass these three provisions? There is, there is nothing special about them that will address, address the so-called problem of restrictions uh, against foreign direct investment. Briefly, on advertising, the question I raised to an expert and former practitioner who retired from the business about 10 years ago, is the proposed amendment to the economic provision of the 1987 Constitution on foreign ownership of advertising needed or still relevant? The answer I got, in the advertising industry, the location, the limitation of foreign ownership to 40% has long been rendered superfluous since a new business model evolved in the United States and Europe in mid-1990s and was adopted in the Philippines in the early 2000s. For context, the inclusion of advertising among industries covered by the 60-40 foreign ownership limitation stemmed from its mass, buy, mass media buying function that was a part of the package, the package offered by full service ad agencies. The premise was that those with access to mass media like TV, radio, and newspapers had the power to sway a nation's ethos and must therefore be guarded against too much external influence. But by 2000, the media depart department was unbundled from the creative and account management functions, making it a separate business entity, independent from what became known as the branding agency, that effectively removing the ownership restrictions from the latter. At present, with the onslaught of the social media, the advertising industry, being an early adapter, has once again metamorphosed to remain relevant and viable. From, from a brand, uh, branding agency, it has become essentially a digital agency. It is doubtful whether ownership will be a significant issue at this time. Perhaps this committee can ask other practitioners in advertising to validate this opinion. If the committee wishes to hear directly from my source, I have permission to give you the name. With regard to public utility provision, is there a need to amend the Public Act 116595 ah, <clears throat> If none, 
what's the point of an amendment to the constitutional provision at the cost of 13 billion for a plebiscite? On education, I submit that there is no need for an amendment at this time until the Congress has reviewed fully the report of the Second Congressional Commission Education that was released a few days ago. It says that we have an education crisis and there is nothing in it about foreign holdings in our college and most <coughs> postgraduate schools. The problem is in, is in preschool, primary, and secondary schools. Internationalization of schools is one of the 28 priorities of EDCOM II, and its substanding committee on higher education will pursue the studies related to 2024, the second year of EDCOM II. Why not await the results of that study? For now, the priorities are lack of budget, misuse of the budget, the need for early childhood care, and so on. Because our students after high school don't have the health, learning, and capability to enter college. And the cost of enrolling in a foreign-owned foreign -owned school may be beyond the reach of the poor without government help. Partnerships may be more viable. In the meantime, In, so, in the meantime, uh, the, the um, page five. In the meantime, the, uh, the, the this committee uh, should should look into the Finma case, which has grown with fourteen local schools plus partnerships in Myanmar and Indonesia. It has two foreign partners with ownership not exceeding forty percent. The arrangement holds. In fact, the partnership of AIM and Harvard was terminated amicably about 20 years ago among, among, for among reasons, for among other reasons, that they said that the Philippines already has the faculty and the experience to go it alone. Today, there seems to be no waiting line for majority or full ownership of college and postgraduate college. In fact, we are cautioned that opening the door to the wrong of, of opening the doors to the wrong schools with the wrong agenda. In view of the foregoing, why the priority and rush to amend three economic provisions? Is it part of a compromise regarding the discontinuance of people initiative in return for some charter change? That may be a fair deal for the Senate, but one does not know if it will hold under this president. Or as the saying goes, is this only the thin edge of the wedge that would later allow the real purpose of the House to overhaul the Constitution with major revisions on the structure and system of government together with provisions toward an authoritarian Constitution? The committee might review the various proposals for charter change and also the past bills of the House in this regard, as well as any attempt to amend Article 6, Section 28 related to the issues of the budget today. It is our hope that the Senate will stand firm against charter change beyond the proposed amendments on the economic provisions of public utilities, advertising, and education. Thank you very I'm, much. Uh, I, I am speaking in the context in the context of what's happening today. In conclusion, may I request the Senate to initiate to initiate the, the passing of an anti-dynasty law, which is long overdue by 36 years, and to amend the party list system that politicians abuse with just three amendments: an anti-dynasty provision, remove the limit of three congressmen from any party because it is a system of proportional representation. And third, deleting the phrase, quote, with a track record of advocacy, unquote, that enabled the Forbes Park resident to represent tricycle drivers. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Monsot, uh, framer of the 1987 uh, uh, 
Constitutional Commission, a member of the 1987 Constitutional Commission, and a former chairperson of the COMELEC. <laughs> Salamat po for a very comprehensive uh, uh, commentary. Uh, next, we'll have uh, former Justice Vicente Mendo Vivi Mendoza, a known constitutionalist. Uh, Justice Vivi, uh, you have the floor, sir. Mr. Uh, Senate President, distinguished chairman of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, Senator uh, Robin Padilla and Senator Angara, Sani Angara, thank you for the opportunity I'm not sure, however, that copies have been distributed. So I'd like to uh, elaborate on that paper. The resolution, the resolution of both houses number six, as I understand it, seeks to amend the Constitution by giving Congress the power to lift restrictions on the operation of public utilities, <coughs> educational institutions, and the advertising agency uh, industry. For example, <coughs> Article 12, Section 11 of the Constitution provides that no franchise certificate or any other form of authorization for the pub operation of public utility shall be granted except to citizens of the Philippines or to corporations or associations under the laws of the Philippines at least 60% of the capital of which is owned by such citizens. Now, the resolution of both houses seeks to amend this provision by inserting the phrase unless otherwise provided by law so that this provision will read as follows. No franchise certificate or any other form of authorization for the operation of public utility shall be granted except to citizens of the Philippines or to corporations or associations organized under the laws, at least of the Philippines, at least 60% of whose capital is owned by such citizens unless otherwise provided by law. The same method is followed with respect to the amendment of Article 14, Section 4, Paragraph 2, regarding the ownership of educational institutions and Article 16, Section 11, Paragraph 2, concerning the ownership of the advertising, of advertising agencies and firms and persons engaged in this industry. Now, Mr. Chairman, my observations on this uh, resolution are two. Number one, it will undermine the fundamental principles and policies stated in Article 2 of the Constitution. This fundamental rules and policies constitute our statement of aims and uh, goals on which our republic is founded. The second observation is that it allows the amendment of the Constitution by methods other than outlined in Article 17 by allowing Congress acting not as a constituent assembly, but as a legislative body 
to amend the Constitution by providing otherwise than is provided in the present Constitution. For example, Mr. Chairman, we declare in Article 2, Section 19 of the Constitution, that we want a vibrant national economy independent and controlled by Filipinos. The proposed resolution amending the Constitution would contradict this. Number one, by allowing Congress acting as a legislative body, not as a constituent assembly, to amend the Constitution and allow the engagement or operation of utilities, educational institutions, and advertising to foreigners. That therefore undermines the basic principles and policies on which this republic is founded. Second, we have an amending clause. And it is basic principle that the amending clause of the Constitution is a very important part of the Constitution because it is the alternative to a revolution. Now, if we don't follow the procedures, I would say the wise procedures of Article 17, the amendment clause of our Constitution, we lose the benefits of several procedures. What are they? In my view, they require Congress as a constituent assembly either to propose amendments to the Constitution, not Congress as a legislative body, or to call a constitutional convention. Now, there are benefits to be derived from such a procedure. Why? Because the two houses of Congress under Article 17 will have to meet as just one body without any distinction whether they are senators or congressmen. Except that when it comes to the time for voting, they vote separately for the obvious reason that the members of the Senate are smaller than the members of the House. But otherwise, they are required to meet as a body. What's the benefit of that? They will have the benefit of give and take. They will debate the issues without any distinction, whether they are congressmen or senators. Not only that, having approved amendments, they will submit this to the people for ratification or approval in a plebiscite to be held within between 60 and 90 days. All these benefits are lacking totally lacking in resolution number six because it will allow Congress by mere law, meaning to say the two houses voting separately in two different locations. The Senate 
here in Pasay City, the house in Quezon City, and they will not have the chance to exchange views, to debate. That's the benefit that you derive from that. And because of that, the people listening to the proceedings of both houses will have no chance to form opinions so that when the proposed amendments are submitted to them in a plebiscite, they will not be able to vote wisely as they should. That's the reason I'm opposed to that. So that two things I repeat, Mr. Chairman. Number one, resolution number six undermines Article Two principles on which our Constitution is founded, our Republic is founded. Number two, it regards the basic principle that any change in the Constitution must be made in accordance with that provision, not by Congress as a legislative body. Let me quote Chief Justice Marshall, and he said, we hear it very often said, the Constitution is the fundamental law of the land. The Constitution is the highest law of the land. Any law that is against the Constitution is void. All this we know. But let's li listen to what was said way back in 1803 when these principles the sacredness, the higher background of the Constitution were uttered for the first time in the Marbury versus Madison case of which I'm sure many of us here have heard. This is what Chief Justice Marshall said in the Marbury case. As a superior paramount law. The Constitution is unchangeable by ordinary legislative act. If RBH number six is approved, we would be permitting the amendment of the Constitution by a method other than the or by, by ordinary method of legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Justice uh, Vivi Mendoza. Uh, next, uh, our last uh, legal luminary to be heard from before we turn it over to our economic experts is Attorney Marlo Distura, the representative of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. Uh, Attorney Distura, go ahead, sir. Good morning, Your Honors and distinguished guests. On behalf of the National President of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, Attorney Antonio C. Pido, thank you for inviting the Integrated Bar of the Philippines for this opportunity to be heard and to be a part of this historic discussion on charter chains. This is also a welcome milestone in my capacity as the member of the Board of Governors of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, a law professor, and a citizen of this country. The Integrated Bar of the Philippines represents thousands of lawyers in various sectors of the government, and uh, whose opinion on the proposal may be relevant. So. This representation will uh, differ the opinion of the IBB on the proposed amendments on three important economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution 
particularly on the grant of legislative franchise, on basic education, and the advertising industry, particularly on the restrictions on the grant, the ownership, and the allowance of foreign investors in the country by providing as a proposed amendment in these three economic provisions of the Constitution by inserting the words unless otherwise provided for by law. We will look into the method proposed by the Congress through an amendment by Constitutional Assembly by both of three-fourths of all the members of Congress. We will also look into whether this proposal complies with the requirement of sufficient standard as well as under control on the part of Congress in enacting legislative uh, <coughs> laws, uh, legislative actions on the proposed amendments. IBP will thoroughly study the proposed amendments and submit its position on this very important exercise of sovereignty. Hence, uh, your honors, I defer the position of the IBP and commit to submit the same as soon as possible or on the next committee hearing if there be any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney. Uh, now we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Gerardo Sicat, who is the first, uh, one of the country's eminent economists and the first Director General of uh, the NEDA in the 1970s. Uh, Dr. Sicat, good morning. Good, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to this important uh, gathering on the topic uh, that we are now very concerned with. I prepared a statement which I suspect could be uh, read uh, a little faster so that I can save time for most of us. I would like to say that at the very outset that I do favor the amendment of the restrictive economic provisions in the Constitution for the reason that they have been, in my view, the prominent provisions of law that cannot be changed for which we have suffered as a nation in failing to achieve the goals of economic development over a long period of time. It has made our country more subject to, to uh, uh, greater uh, volatility because of, uh, because of the uh, failure to achieve major continuous progress in our development efforts. Those provisions have hampered this progress because we failed to invite or bring in foreign capital that is so critical to a country that is not, that is, uh, that has insufficient amount of savings to generate that high level of uh, development. For decades now, we have been, uh, I, I consider them to be the main cause of the country's relative decline with respect to our neighbors in the Southeast Asian region. I think you may, uh, you will find out that uh, I will uh, refer to this kind of comparison because it's critical to look, our, look at ourselves in the context of the neighborhood in which we live. As a country, I think many of our leaders now do 
believe that we need to undertake this uh, uh, adjustment in our policies. But I can see and hear, and I can hear from a lot of previous words that we, we have to be very careful about it. However, I'd like to, to be a little more bold in making some efforts to convince you that maybe we have to, to do much more. The economic reforms to amend the constitutional provisions have been very incremental in our case, and they arrive at a very slow pace. They cannot catch up with the need to make those changes. These restrictive economic provisions have been at the heart of our economic nationalism as a young nation, even before we became independent. At this slow process of adoption, we will become a tail ender in overall progress within the region. In any case, even if we now have more or less been on the way toward a better future, because we have changed some of the policies, a more rapid adoption of the changes will accelerate further our social and economic progress. Undertaking the amendments will be the biggest boost that we need in opening the country toward more modernity, technological progress, higher incomes for our people, better employment for our workers, greater pride in our country's achievement in, e in the economic field, and greater pride in relation to our neighbors as we restore our old position in the past. Uh, I think uh, I've heard enough to say that there is a great distinction between a fundamental law and ordinary legislation. Let me just make the point already pointed out by uh, one of the uh, resource persons in this hearing, that we are the only country in this region with a fundamental law that covers the passage of laws on economic and business matters. All our neighbors, uh, I'll just cite the, the five countries that formed the ASEAN way back in the past. We, were, we, we are one of the five countries, and the other four are Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. These four countries did not have anything about sacred or fundamental laws on economic relations. They just have simple, ordinary legislation for all economic and business matters. They have also understood, I think, the need to protect themselves. They are, they are not stupid in that respect. So uh, they, have, they have learned how to undertake all the kinds of restrictions that they needed to do. But they didn't have to have, to, they, had, they didn't have to put it in and set it in stone in the form of a fundamental law. The fundamental law to which we were all gathered to follow have caused us enormous pain whenever we had to undertake a, uh, a need for change, whenever we have policies that required adjustments, we could not do it. We always look for the second best and the third best solutions and those second best and third best solutions oftentimes lead the country towards greater bargaining of, of positions, exchange of favors, and so on. So possibly you can say that all the other things that lead to corruption and all the things that lead to, to the rent-seeking within the economy are fostered with this. In the other cases, well, you know, they made mistakes. If they made mistakes, ordinary laws are so easy to adjust. And so they can make a mistake and correct them within a year or two. In our case, we made a lot of mistakes and eight decades from now. We realized this after the fifth decade. 
we made the mistakes, we cannot make the changes. We have three decades since the people power revolution, when we thought that we had changed the world. And we, we have not been able to do, uh, we have not been able to correct them because the nation had become divided on many issues. To me, this is one of our problems. The main contents of the restrictive provisions originally went, uh, were of course in the 1935 Constitution. We believed very much in all the things that they told us through our Filipino first policies and all that. And when we wanted to ch make a few changes, we never could do them. We have known this version of nationalism by the deceptively catchphrase Filipino first. Of course, uh, it's a very nice motto. But of course, it, al it also led us to a lot of misallocations of resources to the wrong people who could make uh, us better off. Well, we, we know the story, and I don't have to elaborate on that. From the very start, the rules developed for these provisions imparted a set of complex decision rules that could not be changed when circumstances needed change. Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, or the four countries I mentioned, they have no political constitutions, as I said. They principally focused on the, their constitutions, principally focused on the aspirations of the nation, the structure and form of their <coughs> government, the duties and responsibilities of the main officers of government, and the duties and respons uh, and the responsibilities of the main officers. All business and business and all business and economic matters were only uh, matters for legislative agenda. That, to me, I think is the best solution for us to progress. We will have, we can, we have elected leaders to help protect us. Of course, some of us don't trust elected leaders. That's why we have uh, these kinds of quarrels among ourselves. But in numbers, there will be some people who will protect. I, I think, I, I, I believe that that is a better solution than having a, a law set in stone that we cannot change. Uh, where have I, I? I got involved and I could not proceed a little more. But <laughs> the fact is that the restrictive provision, uh, Singapore, let me see, I, I, I got lost. <laughs> with, you, with your permission, sir, while you're regrouping, we'd like to take time to acknowledge our distinguished minority leader, Senator Coco Pimentel, also a legal luminary in his own right, and our uh, good friend, the senator from uh, Makati, Makati, <laughs> Senator Nancy <Natsubinay>. Binay. <laughs> Back to you. Uh, would you like time? So we'll call, we'll recognize you again. Uh. I will. Uh, what, what I'll do is uh, just keep on going because what I'm uh, what I have said essentially uh, can be expressed by the fact that if the if under ordinary legislation, if we make a mistake, we can make comments. Under our fundamental laws, if we make a mistake, we get quarrelsome. We get into quarrelsome meetings that never end in resolution. To me, that is a setback for the nation, year after year, and that's why we find ourselves now behind Indonesia. Indonesia has now entered a stage where they are far above us in making decisions on national economic issues. They have, they have made their mineral industries produce for them. They have made their forestry industries produce the papers that we use to print our, our boats in the Philippines. We, uh, they, 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 have done, they have done a lot in this regard. 
As a nation, we are very slow to react to the needs of the times, and I hope that our leaders will look to the important needs of our people rather than the limited protest against powerful interests and, consti and constituencies. Our actions with respect to the easing of burdens and obstacles toward the opening of the economy for greater competition are very slow and insufficient. We have to keep pointing out that we are far behind other countries that we have surpassed, that have surpassed our economic achievements to make some elements of our policy-making institutions to move forward. As we go through the implementation of these new laws, uh, I'm not surprised if some element of society would question the, constitu the consti constitutionality of some of the aspects that, uh, of changes. But precisely because of this, we get bogged down again because projects can get stopped because we wait for the constitutionality ruling, and this takes time, this takes resources, this takes uh, delays, and basically even the loss of projects that should have been there years ago. Uh, in fact, this alone is sufficient to remind us of previous cases in which the stoppage of many projects have happened. I, I can cite a few egregious examples, but I will not do that because they're already written in my, in my note. Uh, you can read them if you want to, and I have cited them. Uh, I have listened intent, uh, uh, incidentally, I, I'd like to just make the, the following point. I have listened intently to some of the members of the Senate in connection with, with the issue of the uh, uh, amendment of the Constitution. And I can sense some uh, element of distrust on the issue. Perhaps I would uh, like to make a comment on what I've heard. I heard that foreign, uh, at least uh, I've heard it said, foreign investors do not ask for the amendment of the economic provisions. That's true. They don't ask for them, but they vote for, they vote to their feet on the failure of their uh, rates of return when they enter a country. When they fail to, to earn their rates of return, when they fail to undertake the proper, when they get disappointed in the country, they leave, they, they leave with their, uh, they make their vote. They leave or they continue with us if they like us. I heard also that the poor and many Filipinos do not understand the issue of constitutional change. On this point, I'd like to make a major note. I believe that this statement serves to sweep under the rug and dismiss the benefits of constitutional changes to the poor in our country. The poor are so challenged to improve their living conditions that they are willing to sell their votes to candidates during elections. They attend any rallies to bust them he provided with food and money for any cause and don't care much about. They seek handouts, ayuda, in many forms, only to, to solve their immediate problems. If they understood that this constitutional change on the economic provisions would uplift their lives and that of their children especially, they would embrace these changes gladly, I think. We have to explain these things to them. Moreover, I've heard, uh, well, moreover, the fact that uh, our young people, the first thing they do is to look for jobs abroad and not to look for jobs at home means that their aspirations are not with us because they feel that they have no hope in the country. This thing, I think, will be changed if we make the right moves to amend the constitutions that will help us bring in the foreign investments that I think will raise the level of technology and the level of employment and wages in the country as we move along. There, is also, there are also comments that I heard that there are some priorities 
that the, than the that are more important than just looking at the constitutional amendments that I'm looking for. And I've heard that it may be better to just improve the ease of doing business. That might be the route. Or to reduce the cost of energy, to mitigate the relationships, the economic hardship of the, of the poor because of the high inflationary cost that we have. Or to reduce corruption. Well, my point is this. Various activities designed to improve the economy are likely to improve much more if we attend to the most important need that the country needs. Open the economy in the directions that will really bring the new jobs, technology, and, uh, and uh, opportunities to the few people. This means liberalizing many of the aspects of the Philippine Constitution, moving the uh, undertaking the right uh, changes that we need to undertake. I'd like to address the point that, that we have done enough to undertake reforms to meet some of the changes that we have to do. I, I don't believe we have done so. I don't believe very much that we have done so. So I do not understand why we think that we should not undertake the kinds of changes that I think we need to do, which is to amend the, uh, the constitutional uh, 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 issues that have, uh, that have stymied our growth on a long-term basis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for a very comprehensive uh, and uh, history-based overview, Dr. Sikat. Salamat po. Uh, next, we'd like to, uh, we'd also like to, yes, I think we have acknowledged our colleagues here. Uh, we'd like to go to our former Secretary of Finance, for also a former uh, three-termer of the House of Representatives, Secretary Gary Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, uh, distinguished senators, uh, esteemed uh, resource persons, uh, thank you for your invitation. We, the Foundation for Economic Freedom, have been advocating for the lifting of the restrictive economic provisions in the 1987 Constitution that have for decades served as binding constraint to economic growth and development. We believe that the remo removal of this rest economic rest provisions, restrictive economic provisions, would send a clear and compelling message to foreign investors, signaling a warm welcome to their investments and business operations in the Philippines. We recognize that liberalization laws such as the amendments to the Public Service Act, the Foreign Investment Act, and the Retail Trade Liberalization Act have been enacted in the previous administration. However, the Philippines still lags behind its ASEAN peers in foreign direct investment. Data as of 2022 and indicate that Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand have surpassed the Philippines in attracting foreign direct investments. In this regard, we propose to liberalize, fully liberalize and lift the following restrictions in the 1987 Constitution by allowing up to 100% foreign ownership in the following areas unless otherwise subsequently provided by law. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I will not read them anymore, but I will just cite the particular sections. I will uh, submit our statements so that this can be useful or be used by your secretariat. These are sections two, three, seven, ten, eleven of Article 12, Mr. Chairman, on the national economy and patrimony. Section four, Article 14, 
related to education, science, technology, and arts and sports. Section 11, Article 16 on general provisions related to ownership of mass media and uh, advertising. Mr. Chairman, we also propose amendments to the Filipino First provisions in the following articles in the 1987 Constitution as follows. On Section 19, Article 2, Declaration of Principles and State Policies, which presently is quoted as, the state shall develop a self-reliant and independent national economy effectively controlled by Filipinos. And this is our proposed amendment, Mr. Chairman. I quote, the state shall develop a self-reliant and independent national economy, unquote. Section 10, Mr. Chairman, Article 12, again on national economy and patrimony, presently quoted as in the grant of rights, privileges, and concessions covering the national economy and patrimony, the state shall give reference to qualified Filipinos. We'd like to propose this amendment, Mr. Chairman, in the grants of rights, privileges, and concessions covering national economy and patrimony, the state shall give preference to qualified investors. If necessary, this and future Congresses can subsequently impose appropriate limitations, restrictions, conditions for ownership or safety nets should circumstances and conditions warrant those adjustments, just like most countries in the world and our ASEAN peers have done through ordinary legislation and not via constitutional change. The close and restricted model has been with us since 1935 and contributed to the inability of our country to progress like its ASEAN peers. It is high time to change the business model under the Constitution. The Philippines is the only country in the ASEAN region where restrictions in foreign ownership are embodied in the Constitution. We need to have a legal framework and market conditions that match our competitors. Increased foreign investments in the in the currently restricted areas would generate higher, higher quality, higher paying jobs, boost incomes, provide greater opportunity for more inclusive growth and development for our people and the country. Mr. Chairman, various studies have shown that countries that have embraced a more open economy to foreign direct investments grew significantly faster than others who are more protectionist. There is a direct enhancement in terms of technology, technological levels that foreign direct investment brings, which allows for the local labor force to learn from technical sources. To create a more competitive economy, the Philippines needs further adapt, adaptation to new and appropriate technology to reskill and upscale Filipino workers. And the influx of foreign direct investment can help the government in pursuing this endeavor. Mr. Chairman, we recognize that removing the foreign ownership restriction in the Constitution is necessary, but not sufficient to attract more foreign investors. Other conditions such as the rule of law, good infrastructure, and ease of doing business, among others, must be present to compete with other countries in attract foreign investment. However, removing these restrictions is a necessary first step. We strongly emphasize that constitutional amendments should be limited exclusively to removing the restrictive economic provisions. This focus approach reduces the risk of political controversy and division and allows us to focus more of our efforts and energy in improving the welfare of our people. The removal of the restrictive economic provisions and subsequent influx of foreign capital 
would help improve our competitiveness relative to our ASEAN neighbors in terms of better and more infrastructure, telecommunications, power, and other public utilities. This would allow our government to spend more on education and health of Filipinos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I also submit my statement as well as an updated talking points on the economic restrictive provisions which might be helpful to your committee. Certainly, Thank certainly. You. We'll welcome that, uh, Secretary Gary Tevez. And if any members of the FEF also wish to come, perhaps if they have expertise in the various industries which are... Yes. We will have, uh, uh, with the permission of the Chair and the Senate President and the Senate leaders, uh, hearings on the various industries which will be affected. Uh, so the educational, higher education, uh, advertising and maybe perhaps the public utilities, although really the provision on public utilities is, is only a reiteration of the uh, Public Service Act which Congress just passed uh, a year ago or two years ago. Uh, we'll convey your suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Next we'll have uh, um, the UK educated economist, uh, Sunny Africa, sir. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, I actually have a presentation. Is it okay to flash it? It might actually make things Yes, we'll ask easier. the... Uh, there we are. Thank you. <coughs> um, I'll be very quick. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, Ibn Foundation is always happy to share what we can, even if there are attempts to silence us, even under the current administration. Um, I would like to apologize for all males. If I knew that this would be the, <laughs> the profile of the resource persons, I would have asked our, our female research head to come in. But anyway... Um, our big, puro lalaki kasi eh. Um, sa amin po, yung economic cha-cha is um, unnecessary and diversionary. Um, so much can be done now if we're so interested and willing to develop the country, but it's also counterproductive. Um, it distracts us from more basic changes in economic strategy needed and actually also reduces our legal leverage to change things. Um, I have a couple of main points, but I think a lot of them are about facts. Um, there's... You know, I think there's wisdom to not leave economic policy making to economists. Um, we do have some facts to blow away this fog of dogma about um, FDI. Um, we strongly believe FDI is very exaggerated as a solution to underdevelopment. Development is a very complex phenomenon, as a bit alluded to earlier by Secretary Tevez. But singling out FDI, including charter change, as some kind of major means to development is, we believe, reductionism pushed to absurdity. Um, pinag-usap yung kaangkupan. Um, this, again, um, it's been distributed to the, to the Senate. We'll be sharing it. But this chart is quite straightforward. Um, the major countries of ASEAN are on the left side, including China. The columns are the different sectors of the economy. Um, this is a chart based on the World Bank investing across borders. The last report they made in 2012, we updated with um, data from the Mungtad Investment Policy Hub and also from the U.S. Country Commercial Guide. It basically shows that per sector, green means open, then reddish all the way down to orange less open. Um, the Philippines is on top because as a result of all these um, changes in the laws over the past decades, starting, I think, with the Mining Act of 1995, um, even the constitutional provisions, even without the amendment unless otherwise provided by law, laws have provided for many, many um, opening up, many, many sectors to be open to the economy. So I just want to highlight this. We think it's quite important. There is no basis now to say that the Philippines is among the least restrictive economies, is among the most restrictive. On the contrary, the Philippines is now among the least restrictive economies of foreign investment in the region. Um, that's shown by so many sectors being green as opposed to other countries having more orange and red um, dots. Um, it's basically highlighting that so many countries in telecommunications, power, all the way up even to alcoholic beverages, there are restrictions to foreign investment, 20 to 80 percent. In many sectors of the Philippines, it's 100 percent. We do want to address a point about flexibility. Um, Maybe the point isn't do we need flexibility or not, but whether these provisions are needed or not. Because whether they're in the Constitution or in the law, if they're needed, 
doesn't really matter about the flexibility. And I also want to disabuse us of the notion that we're more flexible once foreign investment comes in. Once foreign investment comes in, we're actually less flexible. Like a drug addict addicted to foreign capital, once foreign investment is in the country, we'll always be scared to st for them to go out. We'll always be scared about the disruption. We'll always be scared about the withdrawal symptoms. So I do want to stress that the flexibility argument is quite irrelevant. The point is, do we need this, these restrictions or not? So many other countries in the region feel they need stronger restrictions than we have right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, just some charts about whether in absolute terms it increased 40 times since 1987 or as a share of GDP it's increased four times as a share of GDP for investment has support in the country. There's no point saying, oh, we're getting so much less. The bigger question is, when this foreign investment has come in, has it developed the country? Um, and clearly it hasn't, so it need to bottom first place, third place. Uh, next slide. It's a very stylized way. It just shows the economic structure of the country since 1947. Um, you'll notice on the three main points. Despite the increase in foreign investment, Industrial and, agriculture, and industrial and agriculture foundations of the economy have fallen. Um, the Philippines right now, our manufacturing is its smallest share of the economy since 1949, smallest in 75 years. Agriculture is smallest in our country's history. Again, this is despite a lot of foreign investment coming in, despite a lot of trade, openness, and globalization. Um, next slide, please. Um, a little bit of a case study, this is foreign investment in the manufacturing sector, which um, was already mentioned, it's 100% open to foreign investment. The manufacturing sector is open to 100% foreign investment, but it has fallen to its smallest share in 75 years. It was 17.9% in 2022. Um, the share of employment in manufacturing is the smallest in the country's entire history. Clearly, being 100% open to foreign ownership in manufacturing has not developed the Philippine manufacturing sector. To make things even worse, about 60-70% of our manufacturing is not even Filipino, it's actually foreign. Um, the Philippines right now is the eighth, has the eighth smallest manufacturing sector. Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, and Indonesia all have much higher shares of manufacturing in their GDP. Um, next slide. Um, again, a short example. Again, um, there's no point gloating about attracting foreign investment and thinking that it transfers technology. Intel and Hanjin were here for decades. They invested billions of dollars. They hired billions, thousands of workers. But when they left for their own reasons, the Philippines has nothing close to semiconductor industry after 35 years of Intel. We have nothing close to shipbuilding industry after 12 years of Hanjin. Same reason, when the Malampai natural gas runs out, we won't have any capacity actually to um, exploit our own natural gas. The real test for foreign investment is not what they do while they're here, because if you want to make money, they have to invest, they have to create jobs, they have to have economic activity. The real test is what is left behind. Um, for investors, without the proper regulatory infrastructure, um, will not leave anything behind. Um, locating the Philippines is not developing Filipino industry. Um, next slide. Again, to highlight, Philippine manufacturing is the smallest in 75 years, but the majority of Filipino manufacturing is actually foreign, whether by approved foreign investment, um, the World Bank's own estimates in our national accounts, or even by um, the revenue share in, in um, the top 1,000 corporations. Uh, the fixation on FDI quantities has distracted and shifted the policy, the focus of policy away from development. When a means to development FDI somehow becomes an end, it stops being a good means to development. Um, next slide. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what other countries have done. I'm so sorry, there's a lot of numbers here. I just want to stress um, this chart this table basically shows the Philippines right now, in absolute terms and as a share of GDP, has more investment than South Korea, Taiwan, and China did, whether in their period of economic takeoff in the 70s or 80s, or even at the present. So this nonsense about increased foreign investment will have development, that was not the case in, in the case of South Korea, um, Taiwan, and China in the 70s and 80s, is actually not even the case right now. We have much more foreign investment, but much less development, because the problem is not lack of foreign investment. The problem is a lack of vision for industrial development. Um, next slide. Um, it's an important quote. Um, the United Nations State and Development Report summarized the development experience over 35 years. They basically said that the core of national development is industrialization, for a great many reasons. And the core of national industrialization 
involves nationality. It's not about having foreigners in your export zone in a, in a low value added enclave. It's about building a national brand. And you will notice there is no point, no country, no industrial power brags about inviting foreign investment. They brag about Samsung, Hyundai, Intel. They brag about national brands because industrial development is about having national brands not being an address for them. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, the last few slides actually highlights um, a problem with the thinking that the world is changing, the world is globalizing. Um, we jumped on the globalization bandwagon in the 80s and 1990s, causing manufacturing agriculture to fall to the smallest shares in decades, some in history. Um, the next few slides highlights, on the contrary, in the last 10 years, 15 years, sorry, since 2000 and 2009, the number of protectionist measures has been increasing. Um, the previous slide actually, the green, sorry, um, yeah, the green bar chart, uh, line chart graph shows protectionist measures since 2008. The orange measure shows liberalizing measures since 2008. Um, for a great many reasons, countries have become more protectionist in the last 15 years because that is in their national interest. Uh, the next slide is for investment measures. Again, a, a bit it's up and down. Green shows increasing investment regulations among new measures. Orange shows decreasing investment liberalization measures. Um, next slide. Also want to highlight, um, we're a bit obsessed about investment agreements, about liberalizing. Um, I think it's useful to highlight, in the last 15 years, over 60 governments have terminated over 400 international investment agreements for being too liberal. Um, and of these 400 international agreements, nearly 200 were unilaterally terminated. Um, the two point I, wanted, I want to stress is, some decades ago the argument was we can't restrict our foreign investment uh, we can't protect our economies because it's against the WTO, it's against agreements that is not hold anymore. So many countries, including Indonesia, are coming up with model investment agreements that are much more restrictive than before. Also, even the WTO, um, with the U.S. blocking appointments to the appellate body, the WTO is now actually um, unable to actually enforce a lot of its um, 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 laws, agreements. Um, last point. Um, in the opening statements, uh, there was a, uh, the OECD investment restrictiveness was shown, um, and the highlight was that the Philippines has the second most restrictive um, investment regime in the world. Um, this, exact same, this is that exact same chart, but I'm so sorry I don't see it right now. The dots are foreign investment flows in each of those countries. What's the point? The point is, if the countries are lined up left to right in terms of restrictiveness, yes, the Philippines is on the right end. But if it was true that restrictiveness worsens for investment flows, you would have an opposite slope of the dots. The fact that the dots are clustered in the 1% to 5% range of GDP, it actually basically says it is not true on an um, OECD um, 83 country level. It is not true that the more restrictive you are, the less for investment. Also, not true the less restrictive, the more for investment. There are a few outliers here, Singapore and Ireland, but even actually taking out the outliers, um, that, that, that conclusion is solid. Um, very, very last point. Um, next slide, please. Oh, anyway, this is just showing the flattening out of trade and investment. Um, I want to conclude by stressing, um, we all want change. There are a lot of problems, but so many things to improve the economy don't need charter change. We don't need charter change. That's it. Thank you. Very much, uh, Sani, for data-driven uh, presentation. It's a good counter-argument. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Mr. Orion Perez Dumdum from the Constitutional Reform and Reunification Movement, uh, or Correct Movement. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, that's actually the uh, Constitutional Reform and Rectification for Economic, Dev uh, economic Competitiveness and Transformation. Reunification. Not unification. OK, thank you. I, I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. OK. Mayong adlaw ka ninyong tanan, labi na sa tanan mga bisayang dako din he. Uh, labi na si um, sina Justice Ascuna, Lolo Jun Davide, uh, taga Cebu, Gihapon, pares na ako. Uh, si Secretary Gary Teves, nga gikan sa Dumaguete, Senator Bato de la Rosa, Senator Coco Pimentel, o si Senate President Mick Zubiri, ako rin bang classmate ang imong manghod sa una, nga si Bea, sa French. <laughs> 
Uh, maraming maraming salamat sa akong kaibigan at idol na si Senador Robin Hood Padilla. Assalamualaikum wa shukran. Um, and to uh, both Senators J.B. Ejercito and Senator Sani Angara, pailawin ang ilaw, luce at lux. Mga schoolmate ko yan dati. <laughs> and uh, to all Senators and resource persons, greetings. All right, uh, let's go to business. Whether or not we agree with the proposals made in RBH number six, it is extremely necessary, in fact, long overdue, to at least amend or at best revise or even completely overhaul the 1987 Constitution because the 1987 Constitution contains some flaws as it was unfortunately quite hastily put together at a time when the Filipino people and many of those tasked with drafting the Constitution were a little way too in a hurry and emotional about certain topics and as such, any full rational analysis, careful and comprehensive research, and full deliberation on the advantages or disadvantages or adopt of adopting or rejecting certain options and features was unfortunately not possible at the time. The end result of these flaws has been that the Philippines has been very visibly and obviously hobbled and hindered by the flawed 1987 constitution from achieving the economic and societal success that we so desperately need because some of the systems that we adopted were incorrect and have been proven to be incompatible with the kind of success that the Philippines deserves. If asked as to what we in the correct movement would describe to be the ideal type of constitution set up for the Philippines, we would describe it as follows. We need an open to FDI economic system with a constitution that is totally devoid of any restrictions against foreign ownership of businesses, as this would represent the most ideal scenario for a Philippines in which job creating international investors and global companies can easily come in and set up operations in the Philippines to create millions of jobs that would hire millions of Filipinos so that we would no longer need to become OFW separated from our families. In addition, we need a constitution that features an evolving federalism that would empower the regions to set up the appropriate policies that they are aware of, that they are knowledgeable with, that they know are appropriate for them, that could aggressively attract investments into their areas and thus spread out these jobs and economic opportunities to the rest of the country and decongest the already overcrowded and overcongested national capital region of metropolitan Manila. We all talk about traffic, right, and over congestion, so many, so many squatters. Well, let's spread out the development to the rest of the country, not only Metro Manila. Federalism does that. We also need to have a parliamentary system set up nationally, as well as parliamentary systems set up regionally to ensure more effective, efficient, and high-quality governance with real-time monitoring by a shadow cabinet coming from the opposition, regularly watching over every move of the government, also known as the administration, and calling out any anomalies discovered before they could ever cause major problems to arise. I did want to say, additionally, the 1987 constitution was written back in 1986. And at the same time, back in 1986, the Vietnamese government enacted their Doi Moi reforms. Doi Moi means renovation which moved their country away from communist, Marxist, Leninist central planning, and they went with full-on capitalism, or at least they did so incrementally, and they started to get rid of any restrictions against foreign direct investments. And look at the effects. In late 2021, the Philippines was overtaken by Vietnam in terms of GDP per capita. Ayan, naumusan po tayo. And I've been to Vietnam, and I was so envious of their progress. I've worked with the Vietnamese in my projects when I was working in Philips in Singapore. So I've seen how dynamic they are and how they can actually speak very good English now because they need this skill to be able to, um, to work in foreign companies that are coming in droves in their country. Now, um, I mentioned a lot of reforms, right? But because next year, 2025, is an election year, 
we know that we do not have much time. So let us, for the sake of being, um, well, of time, concentrate first on removing the anti-foreign direct investment restrictions. All right, so constitutional restrictions against FDI, the Philippines is first to be eliminated. Our economic system is one that is characterized by, by a parochial and autarkist protectionism resulting largely from a misguided form of nationalism that is incompatible with the realities of the Philippines, including but not limited to its lack of local technological and scientific innovation, lack of an indigenous business culture, low savings rate, low capital accumulation rate, weak culture of and entrepreneurship, and many other systemic factors that have caused the Filipino first policy to fail and cause suffering for a greater number of our people. By embedding numerous anti-foreign direct investment restrictions in the Constitution, such as 60-40 and 70-30 equity sharing agreements, favoring local investors and keeping international investment participation low, or outright bans, there is hardly any wiggle room or flexibility as these restrictions cannot be changed when the global economic situation changes. Most importantly, the Philippines ends up at the losing end when side-by-side -side comparisons are made, such as when compar comparing the Philippine constitution against the Vietnamese constitution or against the constitutions of other countries within the ASEAN region. And it is not difficult to see why. The Philippines is the only country in the region with such explicit numerical restrictions against foreign direct investments, while other countries have no such restrictions written in their constitutions. While other countries certainly do have restrictions regarding the entry of foreign direct investments or any regulations, they are often not as restrictive and oftentimes not even requiring that the foreign investor have a merely minority ownership share. And more importantly, they are written purely in statutory legislation, which can be easily amended or repealed when called for or when economic conditions change. I'll give an example, just a little bit of an, uh, of a, an analogy. Kung magsisipilyo tayo, saan natin itatago ating sipilyo kasi madalas natin ginagamit ang sipilyo natin? Lalagay ba natin sa loob ng safe na yung safe ay kinakailangan ng combination at may sa mata at saka yung fingerprint at saka kung ano, may five minute na timer? Siyempre, kaya namamadali tayo, di ba? Kapag kinakailangan natin gamitin ang isang bagay na madalas, nandun dapat ready gamitin, di ba? Yung mga hindi madalas ginagamit, yun yung, yung hindi madalas binabago, yun, ilagay mo sa safe. Constitutions are like you're putting it in the safe. And if you put economic restrictions in there, which should be dynamic, they should be changed whenever things change, whenever economic situations are changed. You're not going to be able to make those changes because of the difficulty of doing so. Recently, there have been attempts to address issues by creating circumventing mechanisms through legislative workarounds, such as making changes to the foreign investment negative list or amending the Public Service Act. These attempts at addressing the Philippines' re restrictiveness, however, are ultimately incomplete and only partially effective because most international investors and global companies look at the Constitution first before looking at legislation. When they find that a country's constitution is restrictive, that country, unfortunately, automatically gets eliminated from their shortlist. How do I know this? Because I've been an OFW in Singapore for a very long time. I've met with many high-ranking people from the HQs in Singapore. Yan ang sinasabi nila. Natatanggal lagi tayo sa kanila mga shortlist. At the earliest round pa lang. Sa constitutional round pa lang. Leaving only countries whose constitutions are silent regarding the restriction of foreign direct investments. This explains why the Philippines automatically gets eliminated early on, while countries like Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, etc. remain on the list and eventually emerge victorious. Again, none of them have anti-FDI restrictions in the constitutions, in their constitutions. Only we do. The problem truly is that a misguided ideology of parochialism and insular protectionism have become ingrained within the Pinoy psyche 
And yet, there is no strong entrepreneurial and business culture supported by a strong culture of frugality and savings that would have allowed new that would have allowed numerous local businesses, business empires to flourish and become globally competitive. Instead, the protectionism set up by the Filipino first policy and ideology had spawned ineffectual and inefficient local businesses owned often by the entrenched local oligarchy characterized mostly by rent seeking and complacency as opposed to excellence and competitiveness. But of course, there do exist examples that prove that Filipino businesses can thrive internationally, proving that protectionism is actually unnecessary. In Singapore, Jack and Jill snacks, of course from the Kokongwei group, are very popular. In China, the Liwaiwai group's Oishi snacks are extremely popular. And I know this because I, I lived and worked in China in 2004, and when I was there teaching English and learning, uh, sort of beefing up my Mandarin, <laughs> so, um, when I was there, some of my students would say, uh, Teacher, teacher, you come from the Philippines. Uh, we have a very nice uh, product. It's uh, called Shanghaojia. Uh, Shanghaojia uh, is the first one of the first one of the first one. This is the best, the most famous snack in China. That's what they were saying. They love Oishi. Oishi is Shanghaojia in Chinese. And they were basically fans of Oishi. And when they found out I was a Filipino, parang, sir, ang galing ng produkto nyo. Ganon. So, ibig sabihin, point ko, many of our companies don't really need protectionism in order to thrive. Doon pa nga sa China, eh, sila nga yung nangunguna. Eh. Sila yung pinakasikat na kumpanya doon sa mga, sa mga snack food. So, you know, but I digress, no? Sensya na kayo. The dearth of investments, both local and foreign, have instead created a situation where there are way more job-seeking Filipinos than there are jobs, job openings available. Thanks to the law of supply and demand, it is easy to see why average and median, sal median salaries in the Philippines are extremely low, as job seekers bid salaries downwards just to have a chance at landing a very scarce job. Jobs in the Philippines oftentimes serve no other purpose than to act as a stepping stone towards overseas employment as the very low salaries mean that most Filipino wage earners will never really meet their most basic needs and becoming an OFW in countries where job openings far outnumber job seekers ends up becoming the only way for Filipinos to feed their families. Okay, here's where I tell my story. Please bear with me. This is, the, these are my experiences as an OFW. I myself became an OFW since the late 2000 when I had made an internal transfer from having worked in Microsoft Philippines and transferred to Microsoft Singapore doing the exact same thing. Okay, I had the same position, same job scope. But instantaneously ended up with a fourfold gross salary in increase. Gross, you know, gross. And once we factor in the higher income taxes and deductions in the Philippines versus the lower income taxes and lower deductions in Singapore, my net income was actually a five-fold increase in terms of the net monthly salary. And many costs in Singapore, at least back then, were almost the same as what we paid for in the Philippines. So enterprise center, where Microsoft was in 2000, chicken rice cost 90 pesos. When I moved to Singapore, when the exchange rate was 30 pesos to one, I go downstairs from the office of Microsoft Singapore and go to the food court downstairs. It's three dollars. Pareho. Same price. So, pero ang laki ng sweldo ko sa Singapore kumpara sa sweldo ko sa Pilipinas. And I was already earning quite better than most, most peers. Now, um, it is sad that salaries are often much better abroad than in the Philippines. But it's, this also often means that millions of OFWs and overseas Filipinos tend to be away from their families and loved ones, in some cases visiting only once within several years. And the environment of the host country will not always be as welcoming as I myself recently learned after I defended a fellow Filipina 
Miss Zoe Gabriel, also based in Singapore, who was maligned and cyberbullied by a few cyberbullies in Singapore, including the very infamous Serene Ho, who happens to be part of a very small group of anti-Singapore government operatives. What, what happened there? I, um, they were trying to say, Mayaman daw sina Zoe Gabriel. And I stepped in to say, actually, hindi, because the cost structure for, for, for foreigners is higher because we do not get subsidies. Okay? School system sa Singapore, hindi katulad ng US, Canada, Australia, where everyone is free sa education. Sa Singapore, if you are a foreigner and you have ch children, you want to send them to a local public school, you have to pay 20 times what the local pays if you are a permanent resident, and you pay almost 40 times that, 40 times what the local pays if you are a foreigner. After I defended our compatriot by explaining why their attacks were based on factual inaccuracies, I became the, big, the victim of their extremely intensely focused and persistent cyberbullying precisely because I had managed to disprove their false narrative that they were trying to peddle. They did everything to try to sabotage me and my family in real life, including stalking me on LinkedIn and calling up the company that was listed as being my employer, and they tried to get me fired, making false complaints against me to Singapore's Immigration and Checkpoints Authority, and even making false complaints against me to the Singapore Police Force. When they found out which parish church I attended in Singapore, they sent fake complaints to the parish rector and even to the archbishop. In addition, they seem to have had access to some database which made them aware of which preschool my son was attending, not far from where we lived. These are real vicious psychopaths. If they were in the USA, they would probably have become serial killers. I made numerous police reports and filed a magistrate complaint, but sadly, cyberbullying seems low on the police priority list. We received so many threats, and I got severely inconvenienced. I was sub subjected to in intense defamation by these cyberbullies, which destroyed my reputation in Singapore, which eventually led me to lose my job and my source of income, and that is why I am here today, in front of you and not in Singapore, attending this hearing via Zoom which is what happened in 2002. I was still working in Singapore then. Our family returned to the Philippines just around two weeks ago, or the, the 14th of January, after selling and giving away many of our belongings accumulated over the, the years and bringing in so many Balikbayan boxes. While OFWs and overseas Filipinos may seem a bit more pro prosperous than we had stayed on in the Philippines, some people in the host countries we stay in are, al are not always that welcoming, and ultimately our host societies are not our home. So even if I had become much assimilated in Singapore, having so many local Singaporean friends and talking to, learning to talk the same way that they do, <laughs> Serene Ho and those cyber bullies still saw me as an outsider. And they were singularly focused on trying to get me to leave Singapore. So, what is my point? Patang haba haba nito. We cannot forever keep on depending on sending out OFWs to work abroad and be away from our families to send money back home. We need to find ways to bring lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of decent paying jobs from abroad to come to the Philippines. How do we do that? We should bring in more international investors and global companies. After all, we OFWs don't care who own the, the companies we work for. I, myself, worked for American and Dutch companies while I was living and working in Singapore. So let's bring them into the Philippines in huge droves. Okay? Now, by removing all anti-FDI restrictions from the Constitution, the Philippines can, at the very least, have a fighting chance in being able to remain on the short lists of foreign companies seeking to invest within the ASEAN region. Eventually, if we play our cards right, the Philippines will succeed in doubling, tripling, quadrupling, or quintupling the amount of job-creating foreign direct investors that we, we bring uh, in. Begging your indulgence, Mr. Dumdum, yes, you've taken 20 minutes uh, already. already. Oh, so uh, if, we, we, if it's all right with you, could you wrap up and submit the rest of your okay. recommendations? We, have, uh, we appreciate the passion and okay. the, the love of country. Thank all you. right. So it was a necessary thing for me to show 
that we cannot continue relying on sending out OFWs. Let's bring the jobs in. So I wanted to say that we in the correct movement therefore agree that RBH number six is on the right track as far as attempting to make the Philippines more open to foreign direct investors. Unfortunately, we wish to state very strongly our position that the use of the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law, while better than the original scenario where such a clause is missing, does not quite uh, in achieve the intended effect of telling the international business community that the Philippines is serious about opening up to foreign direct investments and is sadly a compromise suggestion that was concocted during the Noy Noy Aquino administration's term as a means to attempt to placate his emotional attachment to, the, to his mother's constitution by somewhat defanging such anti-foreign direct investment provisions without deleting Mr. them. Chair. Deletion Mr. Chair. is the only way to go, okay? Now, I, I would say, I would, I'm almost done. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I'm almost done. Senator Lisa, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, all of us, members of the committee, have with the chair um, uh, listened respectfully to the input. I, however, do not appreciate the very personalistic uh, criticism against a former president in relation to who the Constitution. Who can no longer answer. Who can no longer who can, answer. You know, it's not humanly possible for him to answer uh, in relation to his mother, also a former president. And uh, I would just like to seek the chair's support in perhaps removing that from the record and uh, gently reminding our resource person is, to, is that a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, to observe the same mutual respect all of us around the table, members of the Senate and all our esteemed resource persons have been observing since uh, 10 a.m. Thank you, you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you very much, Andrew. So could you state uh, the words you wish stricken, the specific remark you wish stricken of the record? Well, Mr. Chair, if the phrase simply referring to former President Noynoy Aquino, his mother, President, uh, former President Cory Aquino, uh, in relation to the 1987 Constitution about sentimentality. I cannot remember the exact words. I do remember the uh, sentiment, and I feel it is inappropriate to the seriousness of our hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I move to strike it from the there's record, There's a motion. Uh, they're, they're seconded by the Majority Leader and the Senate President. Uh, any objection to the motion to strike off the record the remarks regarding the late former President the two late former presidents, Aquino. Hearing none, the motion is carried. So, uh, thank we'll you, Mr. Ask Chair. The, has been thank you for uh, for that. Uh, the uh, stenographers will take note. Uh, yeah, take, go ahead. Good. Okay, uh, please, thank please, you. please wrap up. Uh, okay, sir, almost done. So, RBH number six proposes at best a mere half measure that will not be very effective. So, right now there are three um, areas that are being proposed. But on, in reality, there are actually six areas, six areas in the Constitution that actually are related to foreign direct investment restrictions. My main point in, is trying to say, why not, instead of just having unless otherwise provided by law on these three areas, let us instead delete all, all of the areas that have anti-foreign direct investment restrictions. And I will name them here. Article 12, Section 2, which is about resource extraction and production sharing. Production sharing. Article 12, Section 10, the general 60-40 clause hanging over every sector. Article 2, Section 11, public utilities 60-40 clause. Article 14, Section 4, Paragraph 2, for the 60-40 for education. Article 16, Section 7, Paragraph 1, the ban on foreigners owning media. Article 16, Section 11, Paragraph 2, the 70-30 for advertising. This does not mean that we will not have restrictions. I am just saying, just like my colleagues who have said over and over again, that these do not belong in the Constitution. We can do what everyone else in the region or around the world is doing, which is to put these restrictions, if we need them, in mere legislation so that we can change some of the wording or some of the numbers when things change, when, when global situations 
arise that, we, that force us to change things. If we put in our constitution words about pager companies, facsimile machines, tele telegraphs, don't you think that we would be abs absurd seeing that these no longer exist today? Wala nang mga pocket bell, di ba? Wala nang mga pagers, wala nang facsimile, wala nang gumagamit ng facsimile. I mean, things have already been overtaken. Even DVDs na nga, nawawala na eh. CDs na Sir, are you wrapping up? So, yes. Because, uh, I'm just saying... It seems you're taking a, another yeah, road. No, no. I'm just saying, I'm just <laughs> could saying... You, could we... Uh, I'm is, just is, saying... Is the finish line inside? Ito na yun, ito na yun. Two, is the two finish seconds. line inside, yes, yes, sir? Yes, yes, Okay, thank you. Sinasabi ko lang, ito yung mga nagbabago lagi. Nagbabago sila. And if we put them in, in stone, if we put them in stone, hindi natin mababago. So let's just put them, take them out of the constitution and put them purely in legislation where they belong and which is what everybody else around the region does. Yun lang po. Gagang salamat sa inyo, Tanan. Thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat po sa lahat ng mga Thank you dito. very Thank much, you. Mr. Dumdum. Uh, we appreciate the input from an actual OFW and from your personal experience. Salamat po. Uh, with the permission of the Senate President of the body, we'll open it up uh, to the body for questions. Of course, we'll respect the... We'd like to acknowledge our Senate President Pro Temp and also one of the authors of Resolution Number 6, uh, the Beauteous. I be allowed to raise my issue first because this is not about the substance. Uh, we, we're it in is, the question... Uh, it is about the... Uh, uh, is it a point of order? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. If it is a point of order, please go In ahead. effect, it's a, it's a point of order. Yes, in please. Uh, food for thought na lang po sa atin ito. What, what procedure are we following? Uh, right now, we are gathered here uh, as a subcommittee. But is this a subcommittee of the Senate as a part of Congress in its lawmaking function? Or are we treating this as a subcommittee of Senate as part of Congress as acting as a constituent assembly? Kasi iba po talaga. Yan lang naman yung main difference nun eh. Lawmaking versus amending the Constitution. So, I'm raising the issue of our procedure. Uh, if we notice our rules, we have specific rules uh, when we are acting as an impeachment court. Then we have uh, rules when we are acting as lawmakers. We don't have specific rules when you're acting as a constituent assembly or a part of a, one half of a constituent assembly or a part of a constituent assembly. So uh, are we proceeding now as lawmakers and then at some point in time there will have to be a formal break when we will declare our gathering as already Congress acting as a, as a constituent assembly? Do we do that later or do we do that as early as this moment, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman? Uh, if I may, uh, Minority Leader, I think uh, it's a very good point uh, procedurally, but I think it's clear uh, that we are acting with, with our constituent power already because we are actually dealing with an amendment to the Constitution. And I agree with you. Uh, our rules are uh, somewhat uh, sparse with respect to constitutional amendments, but if we look at uh, the jurisdiction of committees, uh, Mr. President, under the, the Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, it points out that there are 13 members and that it has jurisdiction on all matters proposing amendments to the Constitution of the Philippines and the revision of the existing law. So that is the only specific, uh, unless uh, I'm corrected, that's the specific uh, um, provision dealing with uh, uh, amendments to the Constitution. It's, that's it, the only one I can see upon cursory... Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Actually, yeah, if I may finish, uh, uh, Minority please. Leader, please, with your permission. Uh, that's the one I see. So that perhaps is what's giving us basis, but perhaps if uh, we have, if we're not happy with that, we can talk to the, the chairman of the committee rules, the majority leaders here, and perhaps that can be addressed and we can, uh, the members of the committee on rules can discuss any proposed changes to the rules and then uh, that has uh, parliamentary, uh, that's high in the hierarchy of parliamentary uh, motions, so definitely it's something that we can elevate to the plenary as early as today or tomorrow. Uh, if uh, to the satisfaction of uh, his honor. If I may add, Mr. Chairman, that is uh, actually the, the first thing I checked. So, pagdating po sa rules natin, as a law-making body, we filed uh, a resolution. It was referred to the proper committee, this one. 
and then a subcommittee was formed. But then, so, but when we now make further steps, if we now go beyond the committee, the committee will now have a recommendation. My point is there must be a clear break, uh, Mr. Chairman, very clear break when the Senate is no longer acting as a lawmaking body, but we are now performing our uh, duties, our tasks as a uh, so-called constituent assembly because we are now uh, acting under Article uh, 17, uh, entertaining uh, to propose amendments to the Constitution. So maybe for today's uh, activity or event, we can justify it using our rules. Yan, uh, sinabi po ng ating chairman. Na, na, and I, uh, I agree, no, bin, binasa ko nga ganun, because a resolution was filed uh, as, uh, in, in Senate as a lawmaking body, our rules accommodated, referred to the proper committee. So, ang aking food for thought, Mr. Chairman, are the steps after, siguro, after this uh, committee hearing that we, if I could just, uh, uh, siguro, advise the majority to start thinking about this point, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, uh, we need to make this formal, formal break para klaro na ano na yung ano na yung ano natin. Kasi, because if we do not make this formal break and we treat it as if we are processing a bill, so ang tanong ko, what is the final product? Although, let us say, concurred in by the other house, then we have now a uh, an enrolled bill we are treating it like it's a law. And we all know a law cannot amend the Constitution. So that is the danger, uh, Mr. President. So just just an advance uh, food for thought, uh, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Minority Leader. That's a very good point. Uh, I think uh, maybe at the start we should have already said that we are uh, exercising our constituent powers under the fundamental law rather than ordinary legislative power. But uh, since you've raised it already, it, I, perhaps it's apropos to say also that uh, the vote requirement is different and the vote requirement will be as uh, indicated in Article 17 of the Constitution, which is three-fourths of all of the members, meaning 18 of 24 senators. So that's, that's one of the differences that you're perhaps alluding to. And uh, on the decision among to whether to propose more specific rules, I leave that to the leadership of the Senate who's here uh, listening intently to you. Uh, is that... Uh, can we settle that perhaps in the Comedian Rules? But uh, one more point, para lang ma, may ano na rin po yung input. Uh, there is also a kind of law, law ito ha, ordinary law, where there is also a different vote requirement. Diba? I think this is the exemption from tax... Uh, tax so, That's majority. So, yes. uh, majority so vote, iba, yes. ibang, ibang majority doon, uh, yes. per the Constitution, but that is a law. But, yes, so uh, kaya nga, so... Uh, let us not look at the vote requirement as if that is uh, because three fourths ang na-achieve, you na, we are already compliant. Be, at the point where. Yes. Uh, but some point ko, meron din kasi doon sa ano ba sa. For saying we must be clear in, in which, yes, power, uh, in which uh, capacity we are exercising yes, our power. Yes. And in that sense, I agree with you, uh, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, actually, nung nag impeachment court tayo, we also made it a point to wear robes eh, just, yeah. to, just to highlight to the people that we are performing a very different function, no longer lawmaking, but as uh, senator judges. Ito naman, we have to do a formal, I'm not proposing that we change, we change, I don't know, we have a dress code, to, but there must be a for, formal break uh, between, between our Senate as part of Congress, the lawmaker, into Senate as part of Congress as the Constituent Assembly. Formal break, po, not an informal uh, assume, assume na lang natin that we did it. So, yan lang po, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thank you for, for those inputs from our legal and constitutional luminary. Uh, before I recognize uh, Chief Justice yes, David, I would like I, to ask Senator Bina if she has any comment on the suggestion to wear ropes. Any, uh, no, no. Anyway, uh, we'd like to recognize uh, Chief Justice David. Go ahead, sir. I submitted a position paper and the preliminary statement, which I not read anymore, Kanina. Uh, practically includes the poems uh, raised by uh, the Honorable uh, uh, former uh, Senate President uh, Akoko. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, Senate President Zubiri. Thank you very much to the subcommittee chair. Uh, we take note of the, the manifestation statement of our good minority floor leader, and we had a huddle with the majority floor leader. We'll take it up with the committee on rules, 
and come up with specific uh, uh, procedures and rules for once all the discussions on the committee level is done, once probably you have your committee report ready, uh, Your Honor, uh, we can uh, move towards uh, that particular uh, uh, s particular meeting as an assembly. It, it's on the part of the Senate, on the part of the Senate. So we can come up with the rules at the proper time. We can adopt it on plenary, and uh, it could be adopted rules of the Senate. So you lama po just for the information of the body, but nothing in the rules will prevent you, Your Honor, Mr. Chairman, from discussing. Uh, amendments, possible amendments and refinements to the Constitution, as it's been done during the time of Senator Kiko Pangilinan when he was uh, chairman of the Constitutional uh, Committee on Constitutional Amendments, as well as Senator Robin Hood Padilla, who's had already several hearings on this topic. So once the committee report and will be taken up in plenary be done, we'll have a set of rules ready for the implementation of an assembly. Thank you very much. Mr. So. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator President. And now, Majority Leader. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just to uh, put on record our uh, sincerest thanks and gratitude to our Minority Leader for pointing out the importance of uh, ensuring that uh, there's jurisdiction indeed uh, with this subcommittee. And I uh, refer to Rule 10 of our uh, uh, Rules of the Senate, Section 18. And I quote that membership of the permanent committees, including the respective chairperson, shall be chosen by the Senate. The chairperson of each committee may be designated, the vice chairperson or such vice chairpersons of the committee, and create such subcommittees as may be uh, deemed uh, necessary. I think it is important to note also what we have heard this morning, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, uh, as uh, mentioned by no less than our uh, esteemed uh, 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 retired uh, Justice uh, Adolfo Ascuna with regard to uh, the uh, track and path that we are uh, treading upon at this point in time. And uh, what we can say, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, in the uh, light of what we will be discussing in this uh, subcommittee, uh, we are uh, ready to settle all of this in the Committee on Rules so that we can uh, further, further discuss this issue. So we thank the Minority Leader for uh, raising this uh, uh, very important uh, aspect of uh, this procedure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Majority Leader and Senate President uh, and Minority Leader. Uh, now if we could open the uh, period of, of uh, uh, questioning of our resource persons, and we thank our resource persons uh, with your permission, may we work through lunch. Of course, we'll respect the hierarchy in the Senate. So, Senate President Zubiri, uh, would you like to ask any questions from our uh, resource person? I'd like to yeah. uh, wave and uh, listen to all the sides uh, of this issue, and uh, I'd, I'd like to wave my other. I'd like to wave my my time to other colleagues. Thank you, uh, Senate President Zubiri. Uh, Senate President Pro Temp uh, Lauren Legardi, you have ten minutes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much to our uh, subcommittee chair and uh, greetings to my colleagues, Senate President and Majority Leader. Thank you. Very basic questions, and I address this to any of our uh, esteemed justices and former justices of the Supreme Court, our legal luminaries. So let's go back to basics. What are we proposing for amendments under the proposed resolution, which is authored by the Senate President, Senator Angara, and this representation? The proposed amendments to the three economic provisions of the Constitution pertain to the nationality requirement for participation in public utilities, basic education, and advertising. That's very clear. Only three specific economic provisions, no political provisions. While the proposals do not fix the level of participation of foreign nationals in the industries, the relaxing of the nationality requirement is expected to be achieved with the insertion of the clause which we included, which you mentioned earlier already, some had comments, unless provided by law. So, so far, I think it's clear I've laid uh, the predicate of where my questions are going to. So, may I ask uh, Chief Justice Davide, sir, uh, Justice Adolf Ascuna, and uh, our other esteemed uh, uh, guests. What is the effect of the insertion of the clause unless provided 
by law. Because under the proposed amendment, the extent of the participation of the foreign investors in the industries is not determined at the time of the introduction of the amendments to the constitutional provisions. Obviously, it's just a phrase. Instead, the relaxing of the nationality requirements will be determined by the legislature voting separately as a constituent assembly. At some future time, in the exercise of our lawmaking power, which will eventually amend the Constitution. In effect, the amendment grants the power to the legislature to modify only the nationality requirement on the industries covered, which I mentioned, which are three, without the more rigid requirements of amending the Constitution. Only the requirements with respect to passing a law shall then be observed when the legislature decides to exercise this delegated power subject to the approval of the executive and the exercise or non-exercise of the veto power. So in short, sir, in five minutes, I have somehow encapsulated the work we will do in the next several months. What it covers, the three economic provisions, the simple phrase that we're adding, unless provided by law, and uh, what it will do eventually, and the delegation of power to the legislature. I therefore ask our esteemed justices, uh, are you in agreement with our humble understanding of the RBH, or the resolution of both houses, which three senators had authored? What are your perception, comments, uh, thoughts, on this, and I have a short follow-up question after that. If my understanding is correct, can you kindly critique uh, the method and the three provisions uh, which we included, and if my perception is incorrect on our RBH, we'll be happy to be educated by you. Thank you, sir. Chief Justice, please, and then Justice Escuna. Resolution uh, of both houses number six, as I observed in my preliminary statement, is not very clear. Whether it is calling for a constitutional convention, or whether, and rather constitutional assembly, CONAS, or it is simply trying to pass its ordinary legislation by vote of three fourths. In which case, like an ordinary procedure of passing laws, once it is voted upon by three fourths, it should pass to the lower house. The lower house will now act on it as if it were an ordinary legislation coming from the Senate. If the lower house will agree to it, it should be by vote of three fourths. Mm -hmm. However, on the other hand, if the lower house will add one more amendment, it may be another amendment. You remember that right now in the lower house, you have the uh, lower house uh, uh, resolution of both houses number two which would include practically all of the economic provisions. The lower house can now include that. Then it will approve with the amendments. What will happen? The Senate and the lower house will call for a conference committee. And that is where the fight, well, probably the end of the fight will come in. On the other hand, if it would be upon us, it would be by a joint resolution. You have to follow the rules on how to call a joint Congress, a joint, uh, a joint, uh, a Congress in joint session. There must be an agreement between the lower house and the upper house to call for a joint session, precisely to act as a constitutional assembly. Thank you for that, sir. May I have your views, uh, Justice Ascuna, please? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, agree with uh, Chief Justice Davide. There is a need to signal that you're acting now under Article 17. Uh, by the way, the word constituent assembly does not appear in the Constitution. Actually, the Constitution merely says Congress is the one empowered to propose amendments or revisions to the Constitution under Article 17. It's still Congress. Uh, however, when Congress shifts from its mere legislative uh, function of making ordinary laws to one of proposing amendments or revisions to the Constitution, it has to signal 
the, the shift? How do you signal the shift? Uh, as I said earlier, by instead of saying, be it enacted, you say, be it resolved. That's already a signal in addition to the title of your resolution, which is to propose amendments to the Constitution. There is no need for joint meeting or joint hearing. The Constitution doesn't require it. It merely says Congress may, uh, by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, propose. So you can do that uh, separately. Uh, but you have to signal that you are proposing now amendments or revisions to the Constitution. And I think it is sufficiently signaled by uh, calling it be it resolved. And then your title, uh, uh, meaning uh, proposal to amend. And you don't have to submit it to the president, unlike a bill that he has to sign. In amending or revising the Constitution, the president has no role whatsoever. It's just Congress plus plebiscite, the people themselves. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, in the case of resolution of both houses, number six, however, uh, you do not